Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the California High Speed Rail Authority's Board of Directors meeting for today, November the 18th, 2021. Thank you from, for joining us from around California. Uh, we hope you find this informative. And for those of you who wish to speak with us today, uh, you'll get your directions shortly. Uh, before we actually start the meeting today, I'd like to uh, welcome Senator Lena Gonzalez. Uh, Senator Gonz there she is. Senator Gonzalez is the uh, senator for the 33rd uh, Senate District in California, which includes much of Southeast Los Angeles uh, County, uh, representing about a million people. Um, in addition to that, Senator Gonzalez is also the chair of the Senate Transportation Committee and the uh, majority whip in the Senate. And now the ex officio member, member of the California High Speed Rail Authority. And for that, we thank you very much, Senator, and welcome you uh, on behalf of uh, your new colleagues and certainly members of the public. And if you do wish to make a couple of comments, uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Chair Richards. I just wanna say thank you to everybody. I appreciate the warm welcome and I look forward to learning and, and certainly being here on behalf of the Senate, um, but also on behalf of um, many uh, folks in Los Angeles that actually want to see high-speed rail see through. So I really thank you all for, for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Gonzalez, and we welcome you again. Um, at this point in time, then uh, we will take the role, uh, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Shank. Present. Chair Richards. Here. Director Camacho. Present. Vice Chair Miller. Here. Assembly Member Rambula. Here. Director Preya. Here. Director Gilmetti. Present. Director Escutia. Director Williams. Here. Director Pena. Director Pena, I think you might be muted. Here. <laughs> Senator Gonzalez. Here. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And uh, the meeting is now called to order. Um, if we can, if, some, if you could bring up the flag and we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, United of, America States of America and to the and Republic. To the Republic. For which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, 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 with liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thank you. We will now uh, turn to public comments. And so, Mr. Secretary, if you'll uh, please let the people who are joining us uh, across California know how they can uh, address the board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, all. Welcome to the California High Speed Rail Board of Directors public meeting. Today we are hosting this meeting remotely via Zoom. In a moment, we will begin public comment. First, we wanna run through some important technical aspects of this meeting for offering public comment. If you are logged into this meeting via the Zoom application, please use the raise your hand feature, typically located at the bottom of your screen so that I may call on you to provide your comment. If you're dialing in by phone, pressing pound two will raise your hand and put you into our queue. Speakers will be called in the order that their hand is raised. Once you've been in the queue and your name is called in the web meeting, please click the prompt on your screen to allow your microphone to be unmuted. On the phone, we will call on you by the last four digits of your phone number. At that point, you'll hear a message that you're being unmuted. Once unmuted, it'll be your turn to speak. Please slowly and clearly say and spell your first and last name and if applicable, state the organization you represent. After your introduction, each speaker is allotted two minutes to provide their comment. I will interject at one minute and 45 seconds to provide a 15 second warning. Our court reporter is on the line to record these comments 
If they need you to spell or repeat something, they may interject. I will notify you when your time is nearly up. At the end of your comment, we will disable your microphone. However, you are welcome to stay on the line to continue watching or listening to the meeting. If you do not wish to provide comment and simply want to watch the meeting, you can do so by logging on to hsr.ca.gov and looking for the link to our live stream. Mr. Chairman, first up for public comment, we have a Scott Kerlbert. Mr. Kerlbert, good morning. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Kelly and staff. Uh, my name is Scott Hurlbert. That's S-C-O-T-T-H-U-R-L-B-E-R-T. -T. I'm the city manager in the city of Wasco, uh, which lies at the southern terminus of CP4. Uh, some on this board may recognize me as the former city manager of Shafter. And in that capacity, I have addressed that bo uh, this board previously. Um, I joined the city of Wasco in July, and I'm aware that the history between Wasco and the authority has not always been a happy one. Uh, but today I'm here to report that although there are challenges remaining, significant progress has been made toward resolving the issues that have slowed progress here. Specifically, I want to recognize Garth Fernandez, uh, the Central Valley Regional Director, and Gilberto Baca, the Infrastructure Delivery Manager, for their efforts in developing an effective working relationship with me and my staff uh, here in Wasco. For a small city like Wasco, a project this size stretches our limited resources beyond their capacity. Garth and Gilberto have been patient as we work through the staggering number of complex deals and decisions necessary to ensure project impacts are minimized and we fulfill our obligations to the citizens and the future of Wasco. Some of the solutions we have developed and are developing might be called creative or out of the box, but I believe will achieve the results we both seek. Uh, fortunately, Mr. Fernandez and I enthusiastically share a common goal, and that is to complete the work in and around Wasco as quickly and efficiently as possible and to move on. seconds remaining. I urge this board to support the solutions in Wasco as we work together toward that goal. And I thank you for your time and consideration this morning. Thank you, Scott. Good to hear you, uh, your voice and uh, glad to see you in Wasco. Likewise. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Samuel Muniz. Good morning, Mr. Muniz. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and board members. My name is Samuel Munoz, and I'm on behalf, here on behalf of Carpenters Local 405, part of the NorCal Carpenters Union, which represents over 4,265 members. We are highly in favor of the high-speed rail and like to express our gratitude to the administration and the governor for sending strong in support of high-speed rail. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Munoz. Next up, Mr. Chairman, for public comment, Fedel Chavez, and I want to apologize for any mispronunciations. Good morning, Mr. Chavez. Good morning, Board and Chair. Um, name, is, name is Fidel Chavez, F-I-D-E-L, last name Chavez, C-H-A-V-E-Z. And uh, I am also calling in support for the high-speed rail, and uh, I'll make it short and quick. And I just, um, with all the support around, we just want to continue continue this project going. It's creating a lot of great jobs for local and surrounding areas. You know, it's great paying union jobs and keep it going. Let's finish what you guys have started. And uh, that is it. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have an Edward Evans. Mr. Evans, good morning. Good morning, Chair Richards and board. My name is Ed Evans, and I'm the uh, senior field representative of Carpenters Local 217, which is an affiliate of the NorCal Carpenters Union. Uh, our local represents 1,670 members, and we are in favor of the high-speed rail project. As you, as you know, this is the largest transportation project in the country. The rest of the country is watching us. Let's finish it. Let's finish what we started. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have last name McFarlane. Last name McFarlane. 
Good morning, uh, Mr. McFarland. Good morning, Chair and Board members. Uh, my name is Onassis McFarland. First name O N A S S I S McFarland M C F A R L A N E, and I'm with the Knockout Carpenters, and I'm in support of the high speed rail. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Dan Nuncio. Mr. Nuncio, good morning. Mr. Nuncio, good morning. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Board. My name is Dan Nuncio. That's D-A-N-N-U-N-C-I-O. And I'm the Senior Field Representative of the Fresno, Madera, Kings, and Tulare Counties for the NorCal Carpenters Union. On behalf of the 2,233 carpenters in the four counties, I'd like to extend our gratitude to the board, the assembly, the Senate, and Governor Newsom for their vision and standing strong in the support of the electrified high-speed rail. Uh, we look forward to continuing and finishing the largest transportation project in the country. Now let's get to work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nuncio. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Matt Kremens. Matt Kremens. Good morning, Mr. Kremens. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Matt Kremens here on behalf of the California Nevada Conference of Operating Engineers, here today to express our strong and continued support of the high speed rail project that has created thousands of jobs in the Central Valley, including many jobs that belong to our members within the operating engineers. We also wanted to be here today in order to express our sincere gratitude and thanks to Governor Newsom and his administration for holding the line in support of this project and understanding the positive impact that this project will have, not just on our members, but on citizens across the state. Uh, we, would encourage you to, we would encourage you to continue the hard work you all have put in to, to ensure the completion of this project. And again, we uh, sincerely thank you for all your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment in the queue is David Schwegel. Good morning, uh, David. Good morning. Greetings, HSR board. David, D-A-V-I-D, Schwegel, S-C-H-W-E-G-E-L, spelled like Schwegel, rhymes with bagel, with Phelps, P-H-E-L-P-S, spelled just like world champion swimmer Michael Phelps, Mr. Talkspace, Therapy for All engineering services. I'm licensed in three states with no overlap to the 10 states where Phelps works. So I'm in their EIT engineer in training program, which entailed so far showing up to the Fresno airport 40 minutes before takeoff, having the customer service center coach me on downloading the Allegiant app for a flight that ended up being taken off three hours late, walking over to the car rental desk to book a rental car from Las Vegas to Reno, driving from Las Vegas to Reno past Area 51 and the Alien Cafe, and having my credit cards canceled when I was trying to fill up my gas guzzling rental because the credit card companies thought that I was abducted by aliens. Here's my recommendation for the board. Book the Majestic Yosemite Hotel in collaboration with the U.S. High Speed Rail Association for a mega leadership in high speed rail conference with this discussion question. We've missed the mark on getting all of California's major population centers connected by 2020. Now what? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schwagel. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Augustin Diaz. Augustin Diaz. Good morning, Mr. Diaz. Mr. Diaz. Mr. Diaz, are you with us? Mr. Secretary, let's move on. Of course, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Uh, oh, hold on, he's here. Um, Sorry for that, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Agustin Diaz. I'm a field representative for uh, Drago Latter's Local 68L uh, of the Nora Carpenters Union. And we are uh, representing 
3,300 members, and we want the, the speed rail to continue working. It's time. I think we've been waiting for so long. Let's do it. And uh, thank you very much for your uh, time. Thank you, Mr. Diaz, and for your support. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have a first name, Pablo. Pablo. Good morning, Mr. Villagrana. Good morning. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Pablo Villagrana, and I am a union iron worker. I'm the president and organizer of Union Iron Workers Local 155, Fresno, California. I want to thank the go our governor and his administration for standing strong in support of the high speed rail and the valley. As an organizer, I see firsthand how the high-speed rail has impact workers in the Valley. I go out to projects awarded to non-signatory contractors and talk to their unrepresented employees. Every unrepresented employee I have spoken to have told me they do not earn a livable wage, health insurance, pension, or annuity. For example, Daniel Gonzalez is a reinforcing iron worker that was paid $23 an hour with 15 years of experience. What's heartbreaking is when he went to the dentist and had work done, he had to pay $5,000 because of the health insurance he could only afford. The high speed rail has changed his life. Because of demand for workers, Daniel joined the Union Iron Workers and went to work for Dragrado's Flat Iron at their Hanford precast yard. Now Daniel is earning $48.90 an hour, but most importantly, he has health insurance for his family, for himself and his family, a pension annuity that will not affect his hourly wage. The high speed rail has and will continue to change lives in the valley. It is the largest transportation project in our country. So let's finish what we started. Thank you guys very much for your time. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment in the queue, we have an Eddie Clement, Eddie Clement. Good morning, Mr. Clement. Mr. Clement. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, uh, go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, good morning. My name is Eddie Clement with the Northern California Carpenters Local Union 1109 in uh, the Kings and Tulare counties. And on behalf of my hundreds of members out there on that job, on this large infrastructure project of the high speed rail, it has helped bring many people out of some of the most impoverished communities in this area of the San Joaquin Valley. This project must continue, the funding must continue. Uh, we need to seek future funding to keep this opportunity to bring people up and out of the poverty levels that we've struck, started so hard to do. We fought so hard for this project and to think that it's even possibly being uh, considered to be taken out of here in the middle of something is unheard of. We support this project and we ask that you stay strong and continue it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clement. Mr. Chairman, next up in the queue, we have a Timothy Rafe. Timothy Rafe. Timothy Rafe, good morning. Good morning. My name is Timothy Rafe. I'm a field representative with Carpenters Local 22 in San Francisco, California. I help represent approximately 3,800 members, and I'd like to voice our full support for California high speed rail. Let's get this done so we can ride a train. Thank you very much. Thank you and thanks for, I'm sorry about massacring your voice or your name. Mr. Chairman, next up we have a Charles K. Charles K. Mr. Connor. Hello, my name is Charles Nauer. I am the field representative for Carpenters Local 1599, affiliated with the Northern California Carpenters. Um, we stand in agreement of the High Speed Rail Project full support. We want to thank the governor and the board. Uh, I currently have 400 members. I have a few of my members uh, working on the project, even though we are up in Redding, California. So it offers good jobs and benefits for our members. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, next up in the queue, we have a Charles Riojas. Charles Riojas. Good morning, Mr. Riojas. Good morning, board. Thank you for allowing the public comment on this very, very important project. Um, I'd like to echo and ditto everything that has been said so far. It's a unique situation where you have a huge economic engine in the Central Valley, which is known to be 
um, some of the poorest uh, communities uh, in the United States, if not California. So I appreciate the governor's support. I appreciate the support from the board in maintaining this particular project. We hope that we can continue to build this project. Um, being from, and I apologize, my name is Chuck Riojas. I am the head of the President Madera Larry King Building Trades Council. I'm an electrician by trade. And so I know firsthand uh, the benefits of apprenticeship and the apprenticeship opportunities that High Speed Rail has afforded the men and women of the Central Valley. And so I would hope that we would continue this project. We are doing everything possible to take full advantage of this infrastructure project, and we will continue to do so in the future if allowed to. So my only hope is to obviously uh, finish this project out, and we will we'll, we'll finish it, and we will connect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chuck. Mr. Chairman, next up we have Jesse Perellas. Jesse Perellas. Good Thank morning, uh, Mr. Perellas. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, Board Members, and even Senator Gonzalez. Uh, thank you for letting me speak today. My name is Jesse Perales, J-E-S-S-E-P-E-R-A-L-E-Z, -E -E and I represent uh, members from Carpenter, Carpenters Local 152 here in Contra Costa County, where we have over 3,800 members, and we are in favor of the high-speed rail, and would like to thank the board for the good-paying union jobs and benefits that it's having in all the communities around. Uh, like I say, we want to keep this project going forward. Thank you again. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna just take this time to briefly go over the instructions, but we do have quite a few attendees already in the queue. For attendees who have joined this meeting via the Zoom application and wish to provide public comment, please utilize the raise your hand feature, which is typically located at the bottom of your screen so that I may call on you to provide your comment. If you're dialing in by phone, pressing pound two will raise your hand and put you into our queue. Speakers will be called in the order that their hand is raised and then Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Rick Solis. Rick Solis. Good morning, Mr. Solis. Can you hear me okay? We hear you uh, loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, Chair Richards and board members. My name is Rick Solis. I'm a representative of Carpenters Local 217 in San Mateo County. We represent about 1,670 members. Uh, and I would like to urge our strong support for continuing this high-speed rail and want to give my gratitude to the administration and the governor for standing strong in support. So um, again, I urge, uh, urge you to move forward with the project and want to give our strong support to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment in the queue is John Belprio. John. Belperio, good morning, John. Mr. Belperio. Yeah, good good morning, Chair and Board Members. And uh, you did say my name right, uh, <laughs> Chair Richards. My name is John Belperio. I am a field representative for uh, the NorCal Carpenters Union, um, calling in representing Local 180. We have roughly 1,600 uh, carpenters here out of Local 180, and we strongly support um, to continue moving forward with the high-speed rail project. This is a legacy project for California. Um, it is imperative that uh, we finish what we started. It would be an absolute travesty to let all this work that you guys have done, that the governor, the administration, Assembly, Senate, and this board has done to connect California. It, it would just be a travesty to let that go to, to waste. So please keep folks working, keep folks connected. Let's get this built. Thank you so much. Thank you, sure. Mr. Chairman, next up, we have a member calling in by phone to provide public comment for the member who has the last four digits of 6694. It is your turn to speak. Six six nine four. You can provide your public comment. Yes. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the board. My name is Rodriguez, and I'm Carpenters Local twenty two thirty six, affiliated with the Carpenters of uh, the California Union, and I have uh, eighteen hundred members who strongly support moving forward with this uh, high speed rail. 
So thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Chris Puglisi. Puglisi, Chris. Mr. Puglisi, good morning. Good, good morning, everybody. Uh, chairman, members of the board, my name is Chris Puglisi, and I'm a field representative for Northern California Carpenters Regional Council. Uh, I currently work for Pilot Drivers Local 34, which is an affiliate, joiner union. We have a lot of proud members down there driving pile on the high-speed rail. Uh, this, the high-speed rail has provided career paths for, for young folks down the valley, and I strongly support that we keep this thing rolling, that we finish what we started. Thank you very much, and happy Thanksgiving to all. Thank you. Good morning. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have a member of the public who will provide it via the phone. For the member joining us with the last four digits of 8086, it is your time to provide public comment. Hello. Yes, hello. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Chairman. Uh, my name is Francisco Martinez, and I'm a field rep with uh, uh, Carpenters Local 2236 uh, for the NorCal Carpenters Union. And uh, in behalf of uh, our 1,300 members, uh, we are in fully support of the high uh, speed rail. And uh, I would like to give my gratitude to the administration and the governor for standing strong in support of the high speed rail. And uh, let's keep moving and, and let's get this thing done. Thank you. Thank sir. you so much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Manuel Harris. Manuel Harris. Good morning, Mr. Harris. Good morning, can you hear me? Which we hear you well. Right. Um, my name is Manuel Harris. I'm a union iron worker out of uh, local 155 out of Fresno. I'm calling in in support of uh, the high speed railroad. This, this career that I have chosen um, has brought me a long way. I joined the union five years ago. I was working a warehouse job making $12 an hour. Now I'm making $48 an hour. I was able to buy my first home this year. And I just want to say happy holidays and thank you to all the board members and the governor for supporting us. And let's get this thing going. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Happy holidays. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, Ruben Vasquez. Ruben Vasquez. Good morning, Mr. Vasquez. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and the board. Um, dear Governor Newsom, I, Ruben Vasquez, a union member of the Iron Workers Local 155, would like to thank you and your administration for standing strong in support of the high speed rail. Not only is this the first bullet train in America, but for me and my fellow brothers, this is a job for a lifetime. The impact that the high speed rail is having on the workers and families is positive in many ways. The high speed rail has provided good paying union jobs throughout the valley. It has opened many doors and opportunities for the union iron workers and their families like myself. This past couple of years, I was able to reach a milestone I never thought um, was in reach. Working at Flight Iron Dragado's joint venture at the precast yard, I was able to move up to foreman in charge of a 12 man crew building girders for the high speed rail. In this process, it helped me pro provide security for my wife and kids um, by buying my first home ever right here in Fresno, California. The high speed rail has also provided stability and comfort for me and my family over the last year and a half as we continue to mourn the loss of our beautiful daughter, Malaya Serena Vasquez, who was deemed terminally ill since birth. Governor Newsom, the high speed rail has been good to me and my family and has made this process easier to cope with. So I ask you, please let us finish where we started. You'll be the large transportation project in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Vasquez. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, Eugene Morse. Eugene Morse. Good morning, Mr. Morse. Good morning, Chair and Committee. Um, 
My name is Eugene Morris. I'm a field representative at Carpenters Local 152, representing seven counties, Stanislaus, San Joaquin, Merced, Mariposa, Tuolumne, and Calaveras counties. I'm calling in behalf of the Northern California Carpenters Union. We represent 3,800 members in the area. Let's keep this, we're in strong support of the high-speed rail. Let's keep this project moving forward. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, Jason Pierce. Jason Pierce. Good morning, Mr. Pierce. Mr. Pierce. Good morning. My Mr. name is Jason Pierce, uh, J A S O N P E A R C E. I'm a field representative for the Carpenters Union. I'm calling on behalf of Local 751 of the NorCal Carpenters Union and the 1,400 members I represent. Uh, we are in favor of the high-speed rail. Well, let's finish what we started. Uh, thank you for my opportunity to speak. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Antonio Muniz. Antonio Muniz. Good morning, uh, Mr. Muniz. Mr. Muniz, I think you're still on mute. Can you hear me now? We hear you now. Okay. Good morning, Chair and members of the board. Uh, my name is Antonio Muñoz, and I am calling on behalf of the Northern California Carpenters Local 713 out of Alameda County, uh, representing over 4,000 members. Uh, and I'm calling in support of a high-speed rail it has created good paying union jobs that allows our members the opportunity to earn family sustaining wages and benefits. Uh, this is a project that has kept many of our members working. Um, so I'm calling in and ask that uh, we uh, move this project forward. Uh, let's keep folks working and let's finish this thing up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minos. Next up for public comment, we have Charles. Apologies. Um, I have a Nielden, Jen Charles, uh, first name Nielden. Yes. Good morning, Mr. Jen Charles. Good morning, bud. Name is Nielden Jen Charles, as I said, N E I L B O N. J-N-C-H-A-R-L-E-S. I'm calling on behalf of Local 46 Northern California Companies Union and our 2,300 members. I just want to say um, thank, the, I just want to thank the governor and the administration for supporting this uh, high speed rail project. And we are in full support of this project moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman. Next up in the queue, we have Jeffrey Roberts. Jeffrey Roberts. Good morning, Mr. Roberts. Good morning, Mr. Chair. My name is Jeff Roberts. I'm a regional director with District Council 16, International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, representing industrial, commercial painters, drywall finishers, floor covers, architectural glass and glazers. I would also like to note that I have two organizers here with me today, Frank Salinas and Juan Rosales, who are both with our organization as well. I would like to thank the governor and the administration for standing tall with high-speed rail. And on behalf of our members in Northern California, I would like to express that we have been on board with high-speed rail since its inception. And being representatives and working members of the finishing crafts, our work has not yet begun on this very important project. We've had the opportunity to bring people on board through pre-apprenticeship programs that have been sponsored through this. And we look forward to putting those members to work on the high-speed rail when our work begins. Thank you again and have a good day. Thank you, sir. 
Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment will be Martin, Martin Espinoza Jr. But prior to that, I want to briefly go over the instructions. We do have about 19 members queued up for public comment. For the attendees who have joined this meeting remotely via the Zoom application, please utilize the raise your hand feature, which is typically located at the bottom of your screen so that I may call on you to provide your comment. If you're dialing in by phone, pressing pound two will raise your hand and put you into our queue. Thank you. Next up, Martin Espinoza, Jr. Good morning, Mr. Espinoza. Good morning, Chair, Board Members, and Senator Gonzalez. My name is Martin Espinoza, Jr., and I am a Senior Field Representative for Local 34 Pile Drivers Union, representing over 1,300 members working throughout the 46 Northern California counties, many of which who are currently working on the High Speed Rail Project. We are in strong support of the High Speed Rail Project. Let's finish what we started in Connect California. Uh, I want to show gratitude to the administration and to the governor for also standing in support of this project. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, John Henry Lopez, last name Lopez. Good morning, Mr. Lopez. Good morning, Chair Richards and board. Thank you for your time. John, my name is John Henry Lopez, J-O-N-H-E-N-R-Y, last name Lopez, L-O-P-E-Z. I am a uh, organizer for the United Association of Plumbers, Pipe Fitters, Welders, and Refrigeration Fitters Local 246, uh, representing Fresno, Madera, and Tulare, and Kings Counties. Uh, I stand in strong support of this high-speed rail. I wanted to uh, echo some of the comments earlier. Uh, we represent some of the uh, most impoverished counties in the state. Uh, this this project has been transformative for this community, not only for uh, workers uh, in this community, but also for the community in general and providing opportunities for them to, to put people to work. Um, it's created, you know, massive life-changing events for, as you've heard, for a lot of these people. Um, I want to show, I want to echo the statements of gratitude to this administration and the governor for standing strong and continuing on with high-speed rail. Um, I want to just echo that we want to, let's finish this, this project and it's um, it's an initial vision, and let's let's wrap it up and finish it up and connect California. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, next in our queue, we have Paul Guerrero. Paul Guerrero. Good morning, Mr. Guerrero. Mr. Guerrero, good morning. I think you're still on mute. There you go. Mr. Guerrero. Paul, if you wish to provide public comment right now would be the opportunity. Mr. Chairman, it seems like we're having some technical difficulties, so we're going to move on to the next speaker while the technical team tries to fix okay. Mr. Paul's audio. Next up, we have White Meadows. Mr. Meadows, good morning. Good morning, Chairman. Uh, I'd like to thank you guys uh, and the governor for uh, standing strong in support of the high-speed rail. Um, I'd like to note that you know this this high-speed rail gives opportunities to uh, a lot of disadvantaged people in the area. Um, I think our apprenticeship numbers have grown dramatically in the years that that we've been uh, doing this project. Um, I'm with the Operating Engineers Local Three. Um, we have over 2,100 members here in the Fresno area, and uh, we have over 39,000 members in Northern California. Um, with with the apprentice opportunities that have been in place with this, you know, we we've had quite a few different um, people come into our organization. Um, one of those is Arlen Harrell. He he actually started his apprenticeship with us in 2015 when the High Speed Rail was going. And uh, he has completed his apprenticeship working on the high-speed rail and now is a journeyman operator. Um, and it has provided him great opportunity for him and his family. So um, I just wanted to again say thank you. Um, we as local three members are in support of the high-speed rail. And I wanna urge you guys to um, electrify this as well. Um, the thought of uh, diesel trains running on this line, uh, I, I just couldn't imagine why we would ultimately end up doing something like that. But uh, 
like everyone else has said, you know, this is the largest infrastructure project right now going in, in the country. So let's start, let's finish what we started and uh, continue. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Robert Topit. Robert Topit. Good morning, Mr. Topit. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? We hear you well. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, my name is Robert Topete. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. I'm going to keep it short and simple. Um, I'm the training director for the Fresno Area Plumbers Pipe and Refrigeration Fitters Apprenticeship Program. We cover Fresno, Madera, Tulare, and Kings County. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank the administration and the governor uh, for continuing to support the High Speed Rail project. Uh, we are, I am in full support of this project, as you've heard all of the, the stories um, with the folks before me. Uh, let's keep this project going and let's finish what we started. That's all I have. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Tepetti. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Michael Lopez. Michael Lopez. Good morning, Mr. Lopez. Good morning. Um, my, game, my name is Michael Lopez, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-L-O-P-E-Z. I'm a resident of Fresno, California and a lifelong resident of Central Valley. Um, I remember growing up and you could see both mountain ranges. These days you actually have to drive up there to see them. You're lucky enough to do anything outdoors. The air is so bad some days. Our kids aren't even allowed to go outdoors to practice sports or play for that matter. Here in California, we pride ourselves in leading the charge and cutting back greenhouse gases. So it really boggles my mind that we're even talking about putting more diesel trains in service. My granddaughters suffer from asthma, much like other children in the Central Valley do. I am not in favor of using diesel engines and we need to stick to the plan and electrify this track. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Mr. Chairman, next up we have Roland Lebrun. Roland Lebrun. Good morning, Mr. Lebrun. Good morning, Director. So um, as usual, let's start on a high note and unfortunately things we really go rapidly go down afterwards. I, I really want to commend your staff for providing a countdown timer to the public as one of the participants' wind windows. You're one of the only agencies in the in the country, in the state, to figure out how to do this. First thing I want to bring to your attention that there is no closed captioning, there's no transcript. This is actually a federal ADA violation that may result in the Fed suspending funding if you do not address the issue. Uh, the next thing is, is that you do not have, or at least I could not find them, any instructions uh, to join uh, the, uh, the call by phone. Um, I've been also unable to connect uh, uh, my phone by following the instructions um, at the bottom on the left. Uh, specifically, I can connect to the call, but the merge code is invalid. This is very strange because this worked perfectly at finance and audit um, earlier this morning. But in closing, um, I really want to talk about all these good people who have been addressing the boards who want to share the skills of like electricians and, and the carpenters and really want to build on the high speed rail. The issue that you have is that what they have been tasked with building in the Central Valley will never ever be a high speed line capable of connecting LA to San Francisco in the three hours. And in closing, my advice to these boards is when the RDP contract is issued, you actually listen to the people who know how to do this, who may actually advise you to electrify UP and BNSF before you do anything else, if you want to do about um, GHG. Instead of what happened, remaining. Yeah, I can see it. Instead of uh, what happened back in, in June 2015, when these international experts were essentially told to go away. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, Eric Garcia. Mr. Garcia. Hello, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, uh, good morning. Good morning, uh, my name is Eric Garcia. I'm a union iron worker out of local 155 here in the Valley. I wanna take this time to thank everyone in support of this high speed rail project here in the Valley as an iron worker, and Representative Job Stewart here on the High Speed Rail Project, I'd like to share 
the doors and opportunities that it has opened for me and my family. I have been on this project for seven years and some change. And through this time, this high speed rail project has brought me closer to home to be with my family every day after work. And has also provided finances to send two of my daughters off to college and also um, finances to purchase my first home. And as a two time felon, it has kept me on the right track and really busy. And with that being said, I would love to encourage the state of California leaders to stand strong and to continue what they started here in the Valley with the high speed rail. Thank you. You guys have a good holiday. Thank you. And you too, Mr. Garcia. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Kevin Maximin. Kevin Maximin. Mr. Maximin, good morning. Good morning, sir. My name is Kevin Maxman, K-E-V-I-N-M-A-X-E-M-I-N. -E -E On behalf of the local 751 of Northern California Carpenters Union and the 1,400 members, we are, we are in favor of the high-speed rail. Gratitude to the administration and the governor for standing strong in support of the uh, California high-speed rail. And that's all. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Next up for public comment, we have Luke Vratney. Luke Vratney. Mr. Vratney. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair and board members. Um, my name is Luke Vratney and I'm a senior field representative for the drywall lathers and hardwood floor layers, <clears throat> local 9144. I'd like to speak in, in support of the high-speed rail. It's been a great project for a lot of our members. I'm also our locals affiliated with the NorCal Carpenters Union. <clears throat> it's been a great project. I'd like to see it go forward. Um, thank you for all your hard work on it. And I would like to wish everyone a happy holidays. Thank you, sir. Happy holidays to you. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Chris Snyder, Chris Snyder. Welcome, Mr. Snyder. Welcome. Can you can you all hear me? Yes, we hear you well. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you very much for your time this uh, this uh, morning. Uh, my name is Chris Snyder. I'm the uh, political director for the Operating Engineers Local Three. We represent about forty thousand members in Northern California. We have hundreds of workers out on the high speed rail, and just uh, here to thank uh, you and uh, the administration for your ongoing support of the rail. We um, have had many many members from. The Central Valley, they've actually already started and finished their apprenticeship program out there. And this is apprenticeship uh, week. And, you know, these same folks could be finished in their entire careers on this line. So we uh, we thank you. We encourage uh, you guys to continue the course. And we're here to do everything we can to support you um, politically uh, with the manpower, um, with whatever we can do. And um, really, uh, really here just to, to, to thank you. And um, the electrification issue too, we are in full support of the electrification. I know that's uh, been kind of bouncing around a little bit, but at the end of the day, we have to have that bridge, uh, bridge the gap and they talk about uh, just transition and that there's nothing better than that, I think in my mind. So thank you again for your time this morning and we will uh, be here again to support you uh, throughout the entire process and over the years. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, Ignacio Diaz. Ignacio Diaz. Welcome, Mr. Diaz. Mr. Diaz, I think you're still muted. Hi, can you guys hear me? We hear you well, thank you. Oh, um, hi, I would like to thank you guys for having me on board right here. And I would just, Honestly, right now I'm busy working, but I just want to put in my two cents and, and thank you guys for allowing us to have this project here in the Central Valley. It's been good for me. I bought my first house like last year. I'm from local 155 from Fresno, California, if I didn't mention that. But yeah, I just would like to say keep on doing, keep on doing this and we should stay busy and uh, yeah, keep going. All right, sir. Thank you for your two cents. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Danny Wright. Uh, Danny Wright. Good morning, Mr. Wright. Good morning, members of the board. My name is Danny Wright, the business manager of Local 246 uh, Plumbers and Pipe Cutters. 
uh, represent 620 members. Um, years ago, California had a vision to build a high-speed rail. You guys are tasked with carrying out that vision. What's happening here in the Valley is changing residents' lives in, in one of the most disadvantaged areas in California. Uh, this project is providing apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship work opportunities for an area that truly needs these opportunities. I urge the board not to derail this project and keep it going forward. Let's finish what we started. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Omar Hernandez. Omar Hernandez. Good morning, Mr. Hernandez. Good morning, board and chair. First off, thank you for the, your time. Um, I would like to, first of all, say my name again is Omar Hernandez, and I am a member of the NorCal Carpenters Union. I'm a field rep here at Local 46, Sacramento. Uh, I would just like to, first off, thank you for uh, everything that you guys have done, going above and beyond to get the high-speed rail going. Um, our state has a time and time again, you know, set the standard for others to emulate, you know, so I really appreciate that you guys, again, are moving this forward, and I am in support of the high-speed rail. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Brandon Lovenberg. Brandon Lovenberg. Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and board members. Yes, good morning or good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brennan Levenberg. I am the business agent of UA Local 246, Fresno Plumbers and Pipe Fitters. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the administration and the governor for the support on the high speed rail project. Uh, this project has benefited thousands of workers and their families here in the valley with good paying union jobs, great benefits, apprenticeship opportunities. And let's just keep pushing forward and finish what we started here. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Chris Moyer. Uh, Chris Moyer. Mr. Moyer. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, board members, distinguished elected officials. Um, my name is Chris Moyer. I'm a proud and grateful member of Pile Drivers Local 34 here in Oakland. And it is a privilege to speak to you on behalf of our over 1,200 members in Northern California, many of whom, uh, as Brothers Puglisi and Brother Espinoza alluded to, are currently working on this project. Uh, you know, so I think it goes without mention that uh, Local 34 wholeheartedly endorses this project. Uh, these members who are working on this project, you know, they're, they're earning very good wages. They're purchasing home. They're pay paying property taxes. They're putting money back into the state. Um, I, I thank the board and the governor and everyone for everything that's been put into this. I, I hope the project continues to go forward and uh, California can continue to set the pace and lead the way for the rest of the nation in this vital infrastructure uh, aspect. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, as we come down to our last three attendees for public comment, I'm gonna just briefly provide the instructions one more time to make sure whoever wants to provide public comment has the ability to do so. Attendees who are joining this meeting who wish to provide public comment via the Zoom application, Please use the raise your hand feature typically located at the bottom of your screen so that I may call on you to provide your comment. If you're joining in by phone, pressing pound two will raise your hand and put you into our queue. Uh, speakers will be called in the order that their hand is raised. Next up for public comment, Mr. Chairman, we have Bruce Gamron. Bruce Gamron. Welcome, Mr. Gamron. Mr. Gamron. I think you're muted. Mr. Gamron. Mr. Chairman, let's focus on the next attendee while we figure out the technical issues okay. with Mr. Gamron. Next up for public comment, we have Martin Espinoza Sr. Welcome, Mr. Espinoza. Good morning. Uh, my name is Martin Espinoza. Good morning, Chair, uh, board members. Uh, happy holidays to you guys. So, like I said, my name is Martin Espinoza, Senior Field Representative for Local 34 Power Drivers. 
So at this time, we got members working at this high-speed rail. We represent over 1,200 members, men and women. Uh, please, we are in support of this high-speed rail. We are strongly support the high-speed rail. Let's finish what we started and let's connect California. Once again, happy holidays and thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, Bruce Gamron. Mr. Gamron, good morning. Mr. Gamron. Apologies. Let's move on to the next person while we figure out the technical difficulties. Next person, we have Noel V. Noel. Mr. Perala, good morning. Mr. Varala, good morning. I think you're muted. Mr. Chairman, let's move on to the next person while we figure out the technical difficulties with this member. Um, the next person up for public comment is Ishmael Neverez. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, there you are. Good morning, Mr. Nevers. Hi, my name is Ishmael Navarez. It's I-S-M-A-E-L. Navarez is N-E-V-A-R-E-Z. Um, I've been a union iron worker for Local 155 Fresno, California for a little over two years. Prior to being an iron worker, I was incarcerated. And when I was released in 2019, I struggled to find a stable job due to my background. Now that I got the opportunity to join the union, I've been able to stay positive and open-minded to learn new things because of the friendship program that provides us with school to learn new skills. Thanks to the high-speed rail, I've been able to stay working and keep my mind on bettering myself and provide for my family financially. I would like uh, to thank the high-speed rail for providing valuable things in my life, such as financial stability, sufficient work hours to maintain my health benefits, and providing job opportunities for people with different backgrounds. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Joe Giles. Joe Giles. Can you guys hear me? Yes, good morning, Mr. Giles. Good morning, I'm, I'm Joe Giles. I've been a member of Operating Engineers Local 3 for 12 years. Um, it's a, It's been a, a real good scene to see the high-speed rail going up. I'm uh, obviously in favor of the high-speed rail, and it, it's a really good thing to hear all the stories from everybody speaking about how it's affected their life in a positive way to be working on this project, and, and I think it would be a really good thing to, to have it continue. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Christian, Christian A. Uh, Christian Artiaga, good morning. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you fine. Good morning, Mr. Chair and board members. My name is Christian Artiaga, field representative for the North Cal Carpenters Union. On behalf of Carpenters Local 505 in Santa Cruz County, we are in favor of the high speed rail. So let's finish what we started and get to work. Thank you for your time and happy holidays. Thank you. Happy holidays. Mr. Chairman, next up for public comment, we have Noel, Noel V, please unmute. Mr. Varela. Apologies, Mr. Chairman. Seems like they have lowered their hand. One last reminder to whoever wishes to provide public comment and is joining via the Zoom application, please utilize the raise your hand feature, which is typically located at the bottom of your screen so that we may identify you for public comment. If you're dialing in by phone, pressing pound two will raise your hand and put you into our queue. Mr. Chairman, after providing the instructions, we have no new attendees and no one has motion to raise their hand. 
for public comment. Okay, thank you, Mr. Secretary. With that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll move to the agenda items for today's meeting. Uh, let me just ask uh, for a moment, do any of the board members need to step away for four or five minutes or are you good to continue? Okay, uh, but uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a quick comment, if I may. Sure. Then. Yeah, first, uh, uh, since this is our last meeting of, of uh, well, I guess second last meeting of the year, our Thanksgiving meeting, I just like to say to David Schwegel that over the years, his optimistic, upbeat, and uh, <laughs> animated uh, public comment has always brought a smile to my face, yeah. and I appreciate yeah. it, and all of the uh, positive comments today, I will attribute as a welcome to Senator Gonzalez. So it was uh, very good to hear all of these comments. Yeah, that was, I, th I think you're right, Lynn. That was quite a welcome. <laughs> all right, then we'll go ahead and carry on. Um, the first item on today's agenda is the approval of the October 21st um, board meeting minutes. And I'll go to the uh, our secretary first for uh, a change to those minutes. Go ahead, Demo. Mr. Chairman, prior to the adoption of the October 21st board meeting minutes, I want the record to reflect that the meeting minutes will be amended for agenda item number seven. Vice Chair Miller provided a brief status report on the committee's work for FNA. And then in addition, the meeting minutes will be amended to reflect that Dr. Arambula was not absent. Um, he joined after roll, roll call for that meeting. Okay, and thank you. And uh, the meeting minutes ought to also reflect that the Vice Chair Miller chaired that meeting. So with those changes, do we have a motion for approval? So moved. Okay, with the, was that, uh, Lynn, was that you? Yeah, I, I was one of them, yeah. Okay, and uh, Henry uh, Perea will be the second. Uh, please call the roll. Director Singh? Yes. Chair Richards? Yes. Director Camacho? Yes. Vice Chair Miller? Yes. Director Perea? Yes. Director Gilmetti? Yes. Director Williams? Yes. Director Pena? I think you're uh, muted, uh, uh, Director Pena. Still muted. You, if you wanna raise your hand, I'll go ahead and accept that was the uh, a yes. Okay, we have a yes from Director Pena, thank you. Mr. Chairman, the motion carries as amended. Okay, thank you. Moving on to uh, item number two on today's agenda is the Central Valley Construction Update. Uh, CEO Kelly, please, good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and board members. I'm uh, Brian Kelly, rhymes with jelly. Uh, and I'm, uh, <laughs> Lynn, that was just for you. <laughs> You know I'm going to start calling you that privately. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and it is afternoon now, so go ahead. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as you will recall, the, mem the members who were here at the time will recall, we did a comprehensive update on the construction status in the Central Valley in May. Um, and as we promised last month, we'd come back in November to do uh, an update to that, to the board. And I'm about to do that, but I did want to just uh, uh, pause for a moment and, and insert something before this. We, uh, as we uh, get into the construction update, we talk about where we are down there uh, on, the, on the project. Uh, I know some have talked about visualization of show us uh, what some of this looks like. We happen to be putting out this week as well, a very short video that's available on YouTube in both Spanish and English and available on our website. But it is our, our fall uh, construction update video. So I thought we would run that first. And it's a very brief, but on the back end of that, I'll get into the construction update if that's okay with you, Mr. Chairman. So if we could, uh, without objection, of course, we can run that. The eye in the sky doesn't lie. Progress on California's high-speed rail system is moving full steam ahead. Projects are being completed. Others are being started. 
and some are taking major leaps forward. This is the 2021 Fall Construction Update. Let's start with a project that's now complete. The Road 27 grade separation was wrapped up in Madera County in late summer. This project means cars and pedestrians will no longer have to cross freight tracks. And that means no more train whistle for the nearby homes. Also nearing completion, Avenue 12 in Madera County. And South Avenue in the northern end of Construction Package 2-3. Another signature structure is underway at the Cedar Viaduct. False work is now shaping up to what will be the double arches of the southern gateway into Fresno. Iron workers will soon begin to tie rebar for the arches. Each arch will be nearly 179 feet long and nearly 40 feet tall. In downtown Fresno, abutment walls are up for the bridge that will cross over the Tulare Street underpass along G Street. Work is also underway on three retaining walls and a pump station that will help keep water from accumulating in the underpass. And you can't help but notice the work happening at the Thule River Viaduct and Pergola in Construction Package 2-3 as it crosses both the BNSF freight lines and State Route 43. There, crews continue to excavate the vents by drilling cast-in drilled holes for the foundation of the structure. 75 columns will make up this more than 3,500 foot long structure. That's nothing compared to the 286 columns that will make up the Hanford Viaduct. This more than 6,000 foot long structure sits adjacent to the temporary girder plant and will be part of the future King Tulare Station. At the Conejo Viaduct and Pergola, Work is underway on the edge beams of the pergola structure. On the south portion of the structure, forms have been stripped for the edge beams. And to the north, crews continue to place concrete to form those beams. Several projects have already been completed in construction package four, including the Garces Highway Viaduct. And then there's the Peterson Road Bridge, which is shaping up quickly. Crews are installing post-tensioning strands, which reinforces the concrete. They'll begin pre-stressing the bridge deck in the coming weeks. When complete, the structure will be more than 153 feet long, 52 feet wide, and will take high-speed rail trains over Peterson Road. Construction Package 4's largest structure, the Wasco Viaduct and Pergola, saw the placement of 40 girders in the late fall. Each girder weighed nearly 158,000 pounds and stretched nearly 135 feet long. More girders will be placed early next year. And just south of Wasco, iron workers are tying rebar for the deck of the Kimberliner Viaduct. Concrete for the edge walls have already been placed, and concrete for the lower deck will be poured in the coming months. With work on the ground from Madera to Wasco, our eye in the sky will help us capture the continued progress of California high-speed rail. Uh, thank you. I, I noticed on the video that it's a little bit blurred because of the Zoom uh, rendering that's part of that, but I will say that um, accessing that on our website or via the YouTube, either in English or Spanish, uh, the video is much clearer in terms of the quality because there's no Zoom uh, rendering involved. Uh, but it does show the advancements we're making on various structures uh, in the Central Valley along uh, each of the construction packages. And um, I want to use that as a uh, stepping stone into the first uh, presentation. I'm, I'm going to be joined this morning by uh, Dennis Kim, who is our, our director of right-of-way uh, services uh, for the uh, for the authority as well as uh, uh, Daniel Horgan, who will join me uh, as well on this call. And Daniel, as you know, is our uh, uh, Deputy uh, Chief Operating Officer who's uh, uh, working in this capacity as the sort of the head of our uh, project delivery uh, team uh, in the Central Valley. Um, as I said, we gave an update in, uh, in May on where we are in the construction uh, in the Valley. And I wanted to come back and update this now because there's been you know, a couple of changes and approaches that we've made. I want to talk about those a little bit. I'm going to have Dennis Kim walk through the right-of-way uh, changes. There are implications of those changes on 
uh, construction schedule that we are evaluating in real time. I'm also joined by our regional director uh, in the Central Valley, Garth Fernandez, who will also join us for this. So first we'll go through a bit of the construction uh, update uh, happy to answer questions as we go or at the end, whatever the members prefer. Uh, and then um, uh, and then Garth will walk through some of the non-construction advances uh, that are also going on uh, in the Central Valley. So with that, uh, if we can bring up the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, just like we discussed in May, uh, what are we driving for in the Valley? We're driving to make sure that we get the full project definition uh, defined. Uh, and in scope and in contract so we can uh, get to uh, what I would call full construction management uh, uh, mode, meaning that all things are in the contract, the scope schedule and uh, uh, scope schedule and, uh, and, and costs are all clear. And then uh, we manage the contract uh, against, uh, you know, more firm uh, standards or, or, guideway, or guidelines, if you guideposts, if you will. Uh, we are advancing the right-of-way acquisitions in a way that we haven't uh, in the past. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, we are updating and advancing design and construction activities. We're expanding some Central Valley work outside of the, the uh, construction lines as well. Garth will talk a little bit about that. And I think Meg Cedaroth will join us uh, at the end of this just to talk about uh, the things we're doing on progressing the station planning uh, in this area as well. So again, all of this is active management of making sure that we are uh, getting all things in the, all the scope to find some of the changes that were made post contract award that we uh, are finishing and finalizing the designs on finally, getting that scope understood, getting it in the contracts and then managing the contracts. Next slide. Again, th this is kind of what we're headed for. I used this same diagram back in May uh, but we are approaching finally 100% design on the structures that are in front of us in terms of the structures we need to build the guideway and the and the structures themselves, the viaducts, the bridges, the trenches. Uh, we're uh, finalizing third-party requirements, uh, getting all the scope into the contract. With that, we get certainty on the right-of-way needs, certainty on the uh, final contract elements through the change order process to get that scope in the contracts. And then we get to full construction management mode, scope, budget, schedule, and we can start reporting to the board on, against a sort of an earned value metric that just has us, uh, you know, uh, very clearly and with great definition describing where we are against schedule and and cost. And that's that's what we're striving to get to, and uh, we're making some progress in that that regard. Next slide. So again, the various elements that uh, we want to cover here again working hard to get all the scope and getting it under contract via execution of necessary change orders. So the full scope is in the contracts. Reforming, we have reformed the management of the right-of-way division. And that right-of-way division is now uh, executing at a pace that it hasn't in the past. We also went with a more conservative right-of-way schedule so that we can be more, we can rely more uh, strongly on the right-of-way parcels being delivered but we need them to be, to be delivered uh, and so and in so doing that will improve our schedule forecasting uh, we are currently working with our program management office uh, the project delivery team and the contractors uh, to evaluate schedules and uh, apply uh, any risk that we need to apply to those and determine uh, a full schedule for the for the construction in the valley and that's a process that we have underway uh, right now. We also are, have established a third-party task force to expedite and complete third-party design approvals and right-of-way uh, reviews. We've done that by assigning uh, some executive leads to interact with the third parties. Uh, Dennis Kim, for example, is the lead with PG&E. Uh, we have several areas where we interact with PG&E and their facilities. Uh, uh, and we have others, Frank Baca, uh, James Levinowski, who are our leads uh, interacting with uh, the railroads uh, where we interact with them. So again, uh, getting third party uh, task force put in place and uh, expediting the review of third party issues as we work through this. We're also working with the design build contractors as we look at the schedule and mitigate any schedule impacts by um, uh, by working with them to resequence work where appropriate to make sure that we can be as efficient as possible as we move forward on this. Next slide. I'm going to hand this over to Dennis Kim to go through the next couple of slides. This is 
an update on where we are in right of way. And again, I want to start by just saying two things. Um, when I looked at the revised baseline schedule, and I think after a subsequent months of coming to the Finance and Audit Committee, and while reporting right away progress, we were also reporting some critical path parcels that we were not hitting a month after month. I asked Dennis to review that right away schedule and to provide a uh, updated and revised right away schedule that uh, gives us more certainty uh, month over month of meeting the parcel demand and making sure that we are doing that. So Dennis is gonna show you with the next few slides uh, what that revised schedule looks like, how it compared to the revised baseline schedule we had before. I would just summarize it by saying, what it shows is some parcels we thought we were uh, gonna get in 2021, uh, realistically, we won't get until 2022, uh, and so we reflect that. But the good, the, the good news is at the back end, it won't take us as deeply into 23 to finish the right of way. We're pushing some of that forward, so um, we will be virtually done, almost entirely done, with right of way by the end of 2022, and just a couple of what I would call stragglers into 2023. But I'm gonna have Dennis Kim walk through that, uh, talk about that, and again, because of that change, we're reevaluating all the schedules with the program management team, the project delivery team, and the and the contractors. But this has turned out to be a good thing because it is now, we are now much more reliable with the uh, contractors and the PCMs on the delivery of the right-of-way. And you will see in Dennis's presentation that our right-of-way volume has picked up month over month over the, cor the course of the last uh, six or seven months. And so we're, we are finally advancing right-of-way at a very good clip and it soon right away will not be the driving issue that's slowing us down. Um, and, and I think um, that that's uh, that's where we wanna be. So with that, Dennis, let me hand it to you and uh, walk through the next several slides. Absolutely, thank you, CEO Kelly. Good afternoon, board members. My name is Dennis Kim. I am the director of Real Property. I am honored and excited to present to you on the dynamic changes and incredible progress regarding the Real Property Department. The significant progress and changes are based on three core initiatives that CEO Kelly and I have implemented. Uh, before we get into the overall status chart, I would like to briefly talk about these initiatives. The first initiative uh, we performed was reorganizing the structure of the real property team. And how we did this was we implemented a fundamentals mapping activity to understand the scope of what needs to be delivered within real property. We also performed a skills and knowledge inventory to understand the skill sets of our team members. And all of this was to put the right team members in the right places. Uh, we now have a focus emphasis on project management with dedicated project managers and CP1, CP23, and CP4 for the real property department. And I'm a huge proponent of a, the PMI, the Pro uh, Project Management Institute principles, which are executing monitoring, controlling, and closing out projects. Uh, so we're implementing those principles from the PMI. Uh, in addition to that, we have early identification of issues. Uh, we have issue resolution logs and escalation logs. We've implemented focus group meetings for complex parcels, and we are tracking parcels very closely and uh, reporting uh, key performance indicators. In addition to that, we have our state staff who are the technical leads focused on the technical knowledge and decision making on behalf of the state. The second initiative we established was short, mid, and long term goals focused on delivery. Uh, in addition to that, we have recognized staff through certificates and other uh, public recognition. In addition, we are cultivating a supportive team environment. The third initiative was uh, continuous improvement, which continues. Uh, using the Lean Six Sigma practices of the DMAIC process and continuing to improve our practices. So as a result of these three initiatives, the real property team has never been better. Production has never been better. Uh, and I want to turn your attention to the actual pie chart here. Uh, for the CP1 through 4, the 119, we have 2,267 parcels that are required. We are close to 2,000 at 1999 at a rate of 88% completion for CP1 through CP4. I want to kind of take you back a little bit um, when I took on this position in April April 1st of uh, 2021. 
when I started, we were at 78.6%. So in a, in a seven month period, we have been able to increase 10, uh, 10% of production for the real property program for real property uh, parcels delivered. Next slide, please. CEO Kelly mentioned uh, us taking an opportunity to revise our schedules based on a more realistic schedule. Uh, so I wanna walk you through this. Um, in real property, we like to say each parcel is as unique as a fingerprint. Every parcel is different. They have different characteristics, different variables, different improvement, uh, different owners. So what we did, was we went through each parcel by parcel, understanding if they were willing sellers or unwilling sellers in the past. Uh, we applied historical timeframes for those different milestones, and we've adjusted um, the timelines for certain counties. Uh, so in front of you, you can see that the uh, orange was the revised baseline schedule two, which was uh, what was in place previously. But we proposed the new revised schedule in blue. And as you can see, month over month, um, production really uh, starts to increase in 2022. Uh, and it picks up. And really, what we what you see here is at the end of December of 2023 was initially when we had identified parcel uh, to be complete. We've actually brought that in five months to be at the end of July of 2023. I think this is a significant highlight here. Uh, in addition to that, um, I wanted to lay out uh, the parcel, actually the, the production count for September of 21. So on this revised schedule, we have identified 11 parcels uh, that we were going to deliver. I'm happy to announce that we've hit all 11 parcels for September. In addition to that, We've actually totaled out at 33 parcels. So it's three times the amount of parcels we had originally identified in terms of production. In October, I wanna turn your attention to uh, October of 2021, we had identified 12 parcels. And later in the, in the slides, I'll demonstrate um, the actual parcel production, but we've hit 20 parcels uh, in October. So uh, any questions from the board at this time or should I continue? Okay, uh, I will continue. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a quarter by quarter basis. I think it helps illustrate how production is going to be accomplished. Uh, as you can see in Q4 in 2021, um, the original schedule had us delivering 23 more parcels. But as you can see in quarter one of 2022, we're just slightly behind in the uh, proposed schedule, but we really pick up the pace in Q3 of 2022, uh, sur surpassing the actual number by 20 in Q3. And in Q4, we have a positive difference of 12 as well. And then in Q1, we have a positive difference of 30. So you can see that the trajectory actually lends itself to high delivery in 2022 and then closing out, really wrapping up those uh, tail end parcels that uh, CEO Kelly had mentioned a little bit earlier. Next slide. So this is a uh, before and after snapshot um, from when I started the position in April 1st and uh, a cut to where we, where we are in October of 31st. Um, this is a slide actually created by Microsoft Power BI. It's a business intelligence tool that we use that produces sophisticated metrics. Uh, and it's intended to work as a flip book uh, of progression. So you can kind of um, compare April 1st to October. I'm going to walk you through how this actually works. So if you look at April 1st, uh, it starts at the top where those 18 parcels in black are. That's where all of the process starts. Uh, it's through an RRL, which is identified. Uh, the design builder ident identifies parcels that we need. And then the green section is the mapping phase. We have to map these parcels in order to go ahead and then appraise them. The black 119 are the task orders that have to be issued in order to effectuate the appraisal work. Uh, moving down to the nine, that's the actual final mapping. The uh, pink is the appraisal phase. And this is in sequence of how we actually uh, work our parcels. 
And then the yellow is in the, in the negotiation phase where we issue the first written offer and we start to communicate with the uh, property owners about the actual parcel itself. And then the blue is actually the delivery phase. It's more of the administrative phase where we close es escrow and we close in the contracts. So as you can see, it's a progressive wheel. Um, I want to turn your, your attention to October 31st, which is kind of where we are today. Uh, so as you can see, some of the highlights here is that we've closed out the task orders. We're progressing them quite a bit. Uh, in April 1st of 2021, we had 67 in the process of starting uh, from the mapping phase and through the appraisal phase to the delivery phase. We had 67% in process. Now we have a resounding 97% starting in the appraisal phase, in the negotiation phase, and to the delivery phase. So it's quite a remarkable difference of progress uh, that we've seen in the real property department. In addition to that, I want to highlight the differences in yellow on the right October slide. This, the darker yellow is in negotiation, and the lighter yellow, the 72, is parcels that are in the condemnation phase with the court process. So th that, that is the before and after shot of uh, essentially how far we've come. In addition to that, I want to highlight that the parcels remaining, the 493, we're down to 268. And in the seven months I've been the director, we've been able to accomplish 45% of the remaining parcels in a seven month uh, time frame. So I think that's incredible progress. Yes, please. Board member um, Yes, thank you. Um, do you also track um, in terms of um, negotiations and completion, um, like un unintended consequences that arise later with the potential sale that you have to address or um, people that are dissatisfied with the outcome of a particular um, parcel negotiation. Do you, do you keep track of that also or have we, a way of doing it? We, we track every parcel by parcel in our system of record, uh, which is mm -hmm. GeoAMPS. So we identify every parcel we need, the owners, the characteristics of that parcel, uh, so we do track it on a very itemized basis. If mm -hmm. concerns do come up from our property owners, we work with them directly uh, to try to address their concerns or potentially with their councils if they are represented. But we do track every single parcel and any items that do come up, we do address that directly with the property owners and we keep those notes in our files and in our record. Okay. Um, is there any way to get obtain some of that information? Yes, so we can look into, I guess we could uh, understand the, the request uh, and then provide you what you're looking for, board member Pena. Okay. I'd appreciate that, thank you. Uh, absolutely. Okay, uh, any other questions regarding this? And if not, I'll move on to the next slide. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, histogram that shows actual parcels delivered. Uh, so what I want to highlight here is in the first three months of January, February, and March, we averaged 13 parcels per month. Uh, since I've taken on the director position of April, from April of October, we're at a 27 per average per month, which is actually a really astounding rate of property. Um, so it's from that first three months uh, of 13, we're at 27. So it's a 200% increase in this calendar year of production since I've been able to, to take on this position. And really kind of to outline and I, uh, illustrate what a 30 parcel month looks like is when people ask me, ask me, you know, what does that look like? Well, 30 is a very high rate. Uh, it's, I like to equate it to running a mile under four minutes. It's possible, but it's extremely difficult. It takes a lot of work and effort to do such. Uh, but I wanna highlight the months of May, June, and September. Uh, I did mention the 33 parcel accomplishment according to the 11 that we had identified in the revised schedule. 
Uh, in addition to this, uh, I want to highlight that uh, we will be tracking uh, and completing a 90% parcel completion for the program at the end of July. This is a major milestone we've set for ourselves in real property. And in addition to that, we want to hit the 95% at the end of December. Um, and in terms of the, the trend already, we've been accomplishing and aggressively acquiring parcels. Mm. Uh, so we're already at an 88%. Uh, so my estimate is that we will beat this 90% in terms of the time frame of, of when we're going to deliver the program. And we will deliver it faster than originally baselined. So I wanted to highlight that as well. So um, any questions? Uh, I think this is the end of this slide and kind of to conclude, we're nearing the 2000 mark for parcels out of the 2020, uh, 2,267 and we've met that milestone. So it's a big accomplishment for our, our, our program of hitting 2000 parcels. Any questions for Dennis? Dennis, I can only say to you that over the years that we've been following Roe and all the challenges there have been, I don't recall having seen this sort of performance in a any specified period of time, uh, whether it was a longer period, but basically just comparing the results. Um, it would appear to me that you and your team have re really been doing a terrific job. Thank you, thank, thank you, you, Chairman Richards. Yes, our thank team you. is incredible. Yes, yeah. thank you very uh, much. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like to make a quick comment, if I may, it's Lynn. Sure. Yeah, th thank you, Dennis. Uh, thanks. Uh, Excellent. I, I really feel like we've had a, a reset, uh, reboot, whatever <laughs> the technology term would be, uh, in transparency and reliability and uh, actually uh, having a, a realistic approach now. And so I thank you very much. You've done a terrific job in a short period of time. Thank you, Board Member Shank. And uh, I just want to thank CEO Kelly. He was the one that initiated uh, the realistic schedule so that we can put this into place. So thank you very much. Thank you. Can we bring the presentation back up? I'm sorry, Henry, was there another? Sorry. Yeah, just a quick question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kim, again, thank you for your presentation. Uh, in our briefing yesterday, we talked about a few things, but uh, I also wanted to just get your perspective on, on some of those parcels that may have third party issues attached to them. And, you know, and what those look like? Yes, board member Perea. Um, we have utility owners that also are landowners themselves. So we work with them in two capacities. We work with the utility owners as a utility owner that needs to be relocated, uh, that might have impacts with our corridor. Uh, and then in addition to that, we do have some utility owners that have vast amounts of land that they've acquired. Uh, that we will be acquiring from them. Uh, so I just wanted to delineate um, what you had mentioned that we do work with them in several capacities and we continue to work with them in those capacities. Um, is there anything else you'd like me to touch upon? For yeah, just, it, it, just something if you could send to the board, not necessarily talk about it now, but uh, if you have a list of all the third party issues that exist on, on the four segments, and um, and you know maybe in, in a column setting, say which ones are are strictly a third party issue with respect to moving utilities, or which one is utilities and land. That way we and, and of course if you as Ryan has indicated, you're developing a, a, an updated schedules that we know when they'll be resolved. Yeah, I think CEO Kelly will be touching upon that a little bit more with uh, Mr. Horgan. Uh, in okay. later in the presentation, um, and then anything you need, board member prayer, we can provide to you. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Kim. Yes, uh, go ahead, uh, uh, Director Camacho. Uh, does when they talk third third party issues, are we also talking uh, issues that have to deal with the railroad? Third party uh, items can be uh, railroad related as well. Uh, we kind of tuck everything into that's uh, not high speed rail into the third party category. So they are a subset of uh, the third party, uh, I guess, grouping. So railroads is a part of that, but it is led by our um, chief program manager, Frank Baca. Well, could you include that information uh, with the uh, information that uh, Director Preo is uh, requesting? Yes, I think we provide uh, 
more information on the railroads in the CVSL report, but anything you are looking for, we can uh, provide to you, to, uh, Board Member Camacho. No, thank you. And I, I, hey, Ernie, I would just comment on that, that, you know, as I think you've seen in some of the CVSR reports in the Finance and Audit Committee, we need a something like a total of 166 railroad parcels yeah. uh, for this project for the 114. I think we stand at so, we're somewhere on the order of 122 in hand right now. Uh, exactly so we've got uh, several more to get, but that's about where we are. But we can certainly delineate, you know, property that's a privately owned that we are need to get versus that that's owned by or relative to a utility or railroad. Yeah, well, uh, Brian, some of the issues that we had with pending change orders and the like, I know are tied up in that that area with dealing with encroaching on space and stuff yeah. like that. So just, I yeah. just wanted to find out where we were. Thank you. Sure. If we could pull back up the presentation. Um, so uh, Dennis did a very nice job of saying where we are in the right of way world. There's a lot of good things happening in right of way, but of course we did, you know, we did reset in a more conservative way what the right of way uh, schedule is. And again, the you know there, we're a little bit behind in 2021. We we make up for it as we go through 22, and we won't go as far into 23, which is good. Although we are having to evaluate and work with our PMO, our project delivery team and the contractor on what it means for schedules. So we are evaluating schedules by looking at that uh, a thorough analysis of what that looks like. And uh, here we're gonna go through the design and construction update of each of our packages that are in front of us. I'm gonna ask Daniel Horgan to lead this. I may jump in from time to time to make uh, certain points, but again, what we're doing now is taking that right away change and working through the three construction packages to understand uh, what those will mean on schedule and also highlight for the board and the public uh, other challenges unrelated to right away that we are dealing with in each of these sections and what we are doing to mitigate those challenges. So with that, uh, Daniel Horgan, if you could uh, take it from here. Okay, good afternoon, uh, Chairman and board members. Okay, um, this slide you have seen several times before. This is uh, showing the geography of the three contracts that we have in the 119 miles in the Central Valley. We've got obviously construction package one, which is 32 miles, which is the most northern package. Then in the center, we've got construction package CP23, that's 65 miles. And then we've got construction package four, which uh, goes down towards Wasco, that's 22 miles. So next slide, please. Okay, this slide shows the progression of the design approval. This is the design approval for permanent works. I mean. That means the guideway, the overbridges, viaducts. So it shows where we are. Um, as of today, we are all designs are complete except five packages. And we will discuss those as we go through the presentation. So we are almost at 100% design completed. This is for permanent structures. However, we do have third party design approvals as well for some of our utility relocations and some of our structures. So of those approvals, we need 684 approvals from third parties. We have secured 551. So we've got about 130 more to go. Next slide, please. Okay, we're gonna do construction package four first because this package is the one that is closest to what we call project definition. I mean, that means having the scope fixed, budget fixed and schedule fixed. So we are, very close to um, getting to project definition here. Next slide, please. Okay, this shows one of the structures. And as Brian said, we are doing an enhanced risk review on all the schedules at the moment. And in the, probably in the near future, we will have a confirmed completion date for the CP4 package. It's gonna take us a little bit longer on CP1 and CP23. Next slide, please. Okay, this shows the scorecard for CP4, and generally it's quite a good scorecard. As you can see, design is 100%. Um, everything is moving well. Overall contract completion in terms of dollars, we're at 73%. Next slide, please. Okay, this shows design progression, design approval. In 2018, we had no designs approved. As of today, we have 100%, that is 14 parcels or packages of design approved. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so we have 11 structures in total on the CP4 contract. Seven of those structures are between 75 and 100% complete. Uh, we have one structure that's between 50 and 75%, and we have three structures that are more or less started. The final one to start was the Amtrak pedestrian underpass. And just recently, our regional uh, director, Gart Fernandez, secured the permit from the city of Wasco. So construction has just commenced on that this week. The contractor is mobilized on site. So all of the 11 structures are in construction. Next slide, please. Okay, this pie chart basically shows the progression of the guideway. So we have 16 miles of guideway complete. And I would certainly urge all board members, if they have the opportunity to visit the site, you will see the completed guideway, including the fencing. And it is, it's very, very impressive. We have five miles of guideway that are underway. There's one mile that's remaining. That section has been cleared and grubbed and we will be mobilizing on there as soon as we move some of the utilities. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna ask Dennis to come in here because we've got, there's 82% of the parcels already secured, but Dennis is going to explain a little bit about the eight parcels that are pending RRL. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Horgan. So uh, board members, this is the CP4 uh, real property production slide. As you can see, eight items have not progressed uh, through our RRL. This is uh, actually intentional. We are trying to work um, with our sister agency, Caltrans, to enter into an agreement uh, where they will take on this work on behalf of the High Speed Rail Authority. Um, so those are those eight parcels. It's our SR46, SR46 project with them. Um, and this was uh, actually through a Kern County settlement, uh, and it's, it does not impact the ARA uh, construction. In addition to that, um, Semi-Tropic is also a stakeholder, which uh, we've entered into a settlement agreement with, uh, and we have worked out um, the areas uh, of where they're going to provide us the right-of-way. Uh, so those parcels will also um, be acquired after design is completed uh, and work plans are provided to our, our, our partner, Semi-Tropic. But as you can see, uh, there are five items in final mapping. Uh, we are going through the appraisal process for four of the parcels. Uh, 13 parcels are in the negotiation, plus four in condemnation, and then nine are in the actual home stretch of the delivery phase of the administrative process. So any questions about this slide, board members? Great, thank you, Dennis. Uh, thank next you, slide, please. Okay, there are two um, sort of significant outstanding issues on CP4 in terms of scope, uh, but will require a change order. First one is the remainder of the intrusion protection barrier. The vast majority of this scope is already within the contract. There are a few thousand feet that we need to negotiate and wrap up. We're working diligently with the contractor to resolve this in the uh, coming months. Uh, we also have a time impact. This is for delays that were incurred and we are negotiating this with the contractor to set a final completion date for this contract. Next slide, please. Okay, if this slide outlines the risks, the unmitigated risks, and the second half of the slide outlines what we're doing to mitigate these risks. So the first one is the semi-tropic design and work plan review and approval process. That is making sure that we meet the contractual timelines and that we do these expediously to ensure there are no delays to the utility relocations. Uh, item two is the Pozo Avenue encroachment permit. And item three is PG&E and BNSF processing of design reviews and approvals. So our mitigations are, we have already executed an agreement with Semi-Tropic, which Dennis and his team and our legal team were pivotal in making this happen. So timelines for design approvals and land transfer are all documented in the agreement. We have also appointed a stakeholder manager for the semi-tropic um, irrigation district, and that is Dennis Kim. Uh, we are advancing the partnership with the city of Wasco. Uh, Garth Fernandez, our regional director, 
is working very closely with the city of Wasco. And the next point is the application of the RAISE grant. So at this point, I would like to hand it over to Brian Kelly to talk about the RAISE grant. Yeah, thank you, uh, Daniel. Uh, me board members, on this one, um, uh, uh, the as you will recall, um, there was an issue in Wasco with a commitment that the authority made back in 2016 to build new farm worker housing in Wasco. Uh, we executed a $10 million agreement to do that. A question arose uh, during 2020, I want to say, about what happens with the old farm worker housing, which had become a sort of a blighted area. Uh, the old farm worker housing was subject to vandalism and and other things within the city. And I think the original agreement never really contemplated who was going to handle the next step, be it the city, the federal government, or the authority. Um, the city of Wasco brought this to our attention. I traveled down to Wasco with Garth, uh, toured the facility with the then mayor. Um, while we certainly didn't have a, you know, a, any kind of a, quote, legal obligation to, uh, to take the lead on this, it, it is part of our uh, our obligation that the board has set to make sure that when we go through a community, the community is left better than when we found it. And so we we spent a significant amount of money to build the new farm worker housing. And looking at that site down there on the former housing and working to demolish that with the city of Wasco, uh, we uh, we chartered a sort of a an idea to uh, to apply for federal grants so that we can find funding to to do this. Uh, we first went with an infra grant that we were not awarded, uh, and then we came back with a raise grant. Uh, and I'm uh, happy to tell the board that uh, on Monday morning of this week, the uh, U.S. Department of Transportation uh, notified the congressional offices, which they're required to do by law, uh, of an intent to award us this grant. It's a $24 million grant for the SR46 project in Wasco. It includes about $9 million to deal with the demolition of the former farm worker housing. So this is an exciting thing for us. We think this will be made more official tomorrow, but that letter indicating their intent to award that was uh, 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 made uh, public and uh, notified the congressional offices who notified us. So we're very uh, encouraged by that. It's an example of us, uh, you know, leading to do the right thing by the community. Uh, and I'm happy, as you heard the city manager of Wasco say during the public comment hearing, we really have developed a better working relationship with Wasco. And we think that this grant will enable us to advance the work in Wasco much, much more expeditiously. And more importantly, it'll, it'll uh, help the community of Wasco build a better community. And, uh, and, and that's what this is all about. So I'm very encouraged by that. And I'm happy to tell the board that we were successful in that federal grant. Congratulations, Brian, to you, Thank your you. staff, and the grant writers for doing that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Second that. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, Daniel, go, you want to go back to yep. CP1? Oh, no, not, not, not quite yet. I, oh. uh, all I would say is what you said, Ernie, is absolutely correct. Um, there has been an ama amazing amount of work done by the authority staff and the guy sitting here on the screen with us with Brian and a lot of prodding and pushing uh, with uh, whatever friends we can find in Washington. And I am convinced, and that happens to be with the FRA also. And I think the FRA took a huge uh, position in helping this through. Uh, had it not been the constant pressure that they got from us, this would have been one of those kinds of things that would have been easy just to turn it back and go another direction because there's a lot of things that they are working on. But what they heard loud and clear from uh, your CEO, uh, our CEO and uh, senior staff, what they heard is how important this is to this project and how important going into communities and leaving them in a position that they're as whole as they were when, when we walked out or even better resonated and um, uh, I saw uh, on your behalf firsthand um, that pressure being applied and I'm frankly surprised that it happened as quickly as it did but uh, Brian um, I, I you you can't uh, be given too much uh, credit for this uh, congratulations and, and for Thank Wasco, you. Wasco um, that's a great community here in the valley that deserves this sort of attention. So thank you very much to you and all the staff. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that, uh, you know, your our CFO, Brian Annis, our head of federal grants, Desi Malone, uh, Sheila Dazar and Barbara Gilliland and the whole team that heads up our grant work really did all the all the groundwork for this. And um, it's their it's really to their credit and the work they did to make it happen. So, look, I'm just happy that we are in a place where we can address the issue head on. Uh, we can resolve the matter working closely with Wasco and we can move forward the project. And so thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, want to just thank the team for the hard work. Yeah. Well, to share. OK. Daniel, do you want to go back to CP1? Yes, please. Yep. Okay, uh, CP1. So CP1 has a few more challenges. Uh, we're not as close to project definition as CP4. Uh, a couple of the bigger issues on CP1 are getting all the scope into the contract, and we're going to talk more about that later. And the other thing is the number of utility relocations that we've got to do in downtown Fresno. Uh, of the 2,000 utility conflicts we have on this 119 miles, 1,200 are in the CP1 contract. So utility relocations and getting scope into the contract are two big challenges. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, okay. could I ask a, a quick question on that, Daniel? Of course. Okay, uh, what does that mean? though in terms of when uh will they be resolved so of course leading to that that answer is what is your timeline what's the schedule who are you talking to what when can we tell the governor and the state legislature yes we have these these significant issues in cp1 but here's the plan and this is when they will be resolved and the reason i ask obviously as we all know is because we haven't had the certainty uh, it continues to push forward and delays in, in our construction efforts. So, so Henry, I, I, I want to take that on for a minute. That is the analysis that we have underway right now. Uh, we're looking at, as uh, Daniel said, we have 1,200 utility relocations. Some of all of those involve some level of design approval by a third party, uh, be it a utility or a railroad. Uh, we have 60% of those. Uh, complete or underway right now, 40% more to go. And we're working with our project management office, the, the project delivery team and the consultants. And you'll see in the presentation here, um, sorry, the contractor, and you'll see in the presentation here that we are uh, getting together to, to put together a task force uh, to tackle each of the third party issues and uh, put together exactly what you're asking for, which is which, how how will we resolve each of these as we go? We're going to come back. We're going to come back and report to you on that. And we also get, get got to get the remainder of the scope into the contract, which we're looking to do in the early part. Finish that in the early part of twenty two. So we are going to be coming back to you with specifics on this. We're giving you the, the sort of snapshot of where it is now. Okay. Uh, and we will come back with that greater definition that you're asking for when we advance that analysis a bit further. Okay, and will that be uh, before May as we submit yeah, I our think, business plan I, I, to the I state think, legislature? Yeah, our plan is to certainly uh, have that settled a bit more by Q2 in 2022. Uh, I think for CP4, it'll be earlier. I, I expect that I'm going to know more about that in December. Uh, uh, and I think we'll be in a better place there. I think the one and two, three, and as you know, we've talked in two, three about commercial settlements that we're still working to settle, trying to get those wrapped up in December. And then we can talk about the schedule with greater certainty. And so um, these are just things that we have to finish. I still think, for example, on four, that, that that will likely resolve and will be in substantial completion in 2022. The other ones where we need to get some of these things a little bit more defined in terms of scope in the contract, the utility issues uh, figured out so that that certainty around the schedule is clear. And, and that's what we're working on uh, right now. We'll come back in the early part of 22 on that. Okay. Uh, Brian? Yeah. Now, uh, one comment, uh, you mentioned that once we have the design complete, then we will add scope to the existing contracts, correct? Yep. And that's gonna be more cost. Yeah, but remember, Ernie, we, we have flagged in the business plan, uh, increased uh, budget need in the Central Valley to deal with these issues. And so we've upped the Central Valley uh, in the Rev2 budget, the Central Valley cost estimate. And we noted, for example, that in CP23, 
uh, we had four specific commercial settlement issues that we had to resolve. Yeah. So we're evaluating all of that. We'll evaluate the cost. But remember, we did uh, pull up the Central Valley budget in the 2020 business plan uh, uh, to being mindful of, of those issues and, and trying to cover those. And we're going to evaluate uh, whether whether we've done enough there. And so, again, it's part of the reset we yeah. do with every business plan. We'll do it again. But uh, but I, you know, we'll. we'll We'll come back with the specificity on that uh, as we finish this event analysis. I just wanted to mention it so that we aren't absolutely shocked if, in fact, when you come back from for uh, a change order on those areas. Yeah, well, again, I'll just specifically on change orders, the way we get the scope in the contract is through the execution of change orders. Yeah. And so as the board That's knows, right. yeah. yeah. So uh, those are things that we are discussing and we'll get into on uh, two, three, as uh, Daniel goes through this. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, yeah. back in. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this shows the progression of design approvals. Back in 2018, we had nine approvals out of 40. Uh, as of today, we got 38 approvals out of 40. And we anticipate those two being complete by the end of this year. Next slide, please. The two outstanding approvals are both at 100% design. Uh, the first one is the two and a half miles of guideway that was originally envisaged to be in the SR99 realignment contract. That is, we're pending uh, some input from Union Pacific Railroad to finalize that design. And the sweeper package is just going through internal review. So. We're pretty confident both will be complete by the end of the year. And Mr. Harkin, would you again, would you explain the, the sweeper package? Yeah, the sweeper package, there were some items that could have been put in the track and systems contract or they could have been put in the civil contract. And a decision was made that some of the items that were originally planned for track and systems would be added to the civil contracts because they were more civil type works than systems type work. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Next slide, please. Okay, we've got, this is the pie chart of structures progress. We got 33 structures. And anybody who's tra traveled through Fresno will have seen that there are a lot of completed structures. So we've got 16 structures that are between 75 and 100% complete. Um, we've got another nine that are advancing. And we got eight structures that are haven't started yet, and they may not be started for various reasons. We may not have the right of way. We may not have environmental approvals. We may not have third-party walkthroughs, third-party agreements. We may be waiting for construction walkthroughs, or it could even be um, land conveyance rights. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the pie chart of the guideway. Uh, so we've got approximately half the guideway complete or near complete, and the rest of it, we need to clear the utilities to get access to the guideway, which we are working our way through in the next six to 12 months. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, right away, we've got 92% of the right away. Right away is no longer on the critical path for CP1. Um, so this is, Good news and good progress on the right away for CP1. Next slide, please. Okay, we spoke about one of the challenges, getting all the scope into this contract. So there are six major items of scope. Most of these uh, have been known about for a while and most of them resulted from third party agreements that were executed after the CP1 contract was awarded to TPZP. So the first one is Church Avenue, grade separations. This is an exceptionally complicated area. We're putting in some structures between two railways, between the BNSF and Union Pacific Railroad. So this is at this point is being negotiated. We also have the downtown area. We got the changes at Tulare, Ventura, Fresno Street, bridges and undercrossings. These were all requested by Union Pacific Railroad. They wanted wider bridges. Again, we had uh, a request to realign the Golden State North and South uh, roadway. So there was four miles of realignment. This went from a two to four lane highway 
and also included bicycle lanes. This was part of the agreement we had with the city of Fresno. Next slide, please. Got three more here. We've got McKinley Avenue. Again, this was a change in configuration to increase the bridge length, relocate traction power substation. And there was also some city of Fresno traffic control system and utility works. So Belmont Avenue, this will be, uh, this is, we have got an agreement with TPZP on this. We will be executing a change order in the near future, and that will be notified to the board in the coming months. Again, this was part of the city of Fresno request the design refinement. And the final big scope item is the two and a half miles of guideway that was originally planned to be in the SR99 realignment. That could not be executed in the SR99 uh, realignment contract because of some AT&T works that could not be relocated on time. Next slide, please. Okay. Before you go there, uh, Daniel, on, on the um, downtown area with UP uh, are, are requesting wider bridges. Was that requesting or requiring? That was part of the agreement we signed with Union Pacific Railroad. I don't have the specific details. Brian, do you have those? No, sorry, I don't have those with me now, but I mean, uh, this was the requirement to get the approval to move forward on the project from UP included uh, this change to the scope. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think it was, they were requiring it yes. also, yeah. Yeah, no, I don't think it was optional. Uh, no, I don't either. Okay, so if we look at the risk areas, we've got we got a significant amount of AT&T cutovers. We're our a lot of our intrusion protection barrier is sitting right on top of a, an AT&T duck bank. That AT&T duck bank is supplying a lot of the internet for Fresno and their surrounding areas. So. The cutover times here are critical. We are engaging actively with AT&T here. We also have a significant amount of PG&E um, relocation. So the timely design approval of these are very important. And we are working with PG&E here. Other areas, timeliness of design approval and right away crossing agreements with the railroad partners. And obviously the big issue is finalizing the scope and getting all the scope into the contract because we will not have full project definition of all the scope is included in the contract. So how we're mitigating these issues, um, we have appointed an executive in charge of our agreement with PG&E, and that is Dennis Kemp. Dennis has already negotiated one concession with PG&E, which allows us to have our design refresh period extended from six months to 12 months. What was happening in the past was, if we had a design that was approved more than six months, and we hadn't enabled construction, we had to go back and do a redesign. And this was causing significant delays. So Dennis also has quite a few other items that he's gonna to present to PG&E, which will, if agreed, will expedite the whole approval process and enable faster construction. As Brian said earlier, we have established a third party task force. And this is basically to focus on how we can improve and expedite approvals and agreements with all our third parties. That includes utility companies, railroads, municipalities, cities, towns. Item three is basically we are aggressively negotiating the scope with TPZP to get it into the contract. We have added additional estimators on our side and so has TPZP to try to get the scope into the contract in a timely manner. Next slide, please. Okay, construction package two tree. This is the one that is, has, well, has a few more challenges. The biggest single challenge here is the commercial disputes. We have four commercial disputes, which uh, Brian has discussed at the board meeting. They are also documented in the 2020 business plan. Um, and we have one other unique challenge here. We have we have quite a few transmission lines to be relocated and we have, we're working with 14 different irrigation districts to relocate canals and both the transmission lines and the canals have restricted periods each year where we can do the work. So if we miss those windows of opportunity for any reason, it can mean that we have what we call a day to year delay. 
So we are actively engaging to make sure this does not happen. Next slide, please. Okay, scorecard here. Pretty good, but you can see there's still quite a few utilities to be relocated, uh, similarly with structures. Guideway is very well advanced here. The reason for the significant advancement in Guideway on CP23 is that there are less utilities than we have on the CP1 package because a lot of it, a lot of CP23 is going through uh, farmland. Next slide. Okay, this is the snapshot of design status. Back in 2018, there were two uh, design packages approved out of 109. As of today, we have 106 design packages approved. There are three outstanding, and we anticipate we they will be complete by Q1 2022, and we'll discuss those in the next slide. Next slide, please. So we've got Cold Slough, which is at 90% design. We got Dutch John Cut, which is also at 90%, and we got the Alpop Pond structures, which are at 100%. These three, we all we're waiting for here is access to the right away so that we can take some geotech sampling and that will complete these designs. That's why it won't be complete until Q1 next year. Next slide, please. Okay, we got 49 structures on CP23. So this, Question. Part, yes, of course. Uh uh, in particular, dealing with the agricultural land, um, has sinkage um, posed a problem and how are you addressing that? That's a very good question. Yes, there has been settlement in some areas. And in some areas we have, we have set the alignment at a lower level to compensate for settlement. So basically we've reduced the rail level in some cases by maybe two feet or three feet, depending on how much the ground has settled. Okay. Does that answer your question? Uh, does that, how go, going into the future, um, if there's further sinkage, does the design that you're working with um, guard against that? Yes, it does. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so we got 12 structures here that are between 75 and 100% complete. As most of you may know already, we haven't opened any of the overbridges on this CP2 tree section yet. We probably now have six or seven overbridges that should be ready for opening in the coming three to six months. So a lot of these bridges will go into service and start serving the uh, commuters and the public in the near future. We've got another 16 structures that are between, 17 structures that are between 1% and 75% complete. And we still have 20 structures that have not started. So getting these structures started and into construction is our priority. Next slide, please. Okay, this shows the progress of the guideway. We got 29 miles underway. Uh, we got another 17 miles um, that we need to start, and we've got 19 miles complete. So guideway is making good progress here. Next slide. Okay, this is obviously another one of our challenges, and um, Dennis has done a great job here. Fortunately, of the 143 parcels that are left, a significant proportion of these parcels are in what we call the gold region. So we got 64 in negotiation and we got 62 in condemnation. So basically for land acquisition here, we're in the home straight. So within the next 12 to 14 months, all the land should be delivered to the design build contractor. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, Big commercial issues. The Hanford Viaduct, the substructure is substantially complete. Uh, we have just executed a time and materials change order to commence the work on the superstructure. This is to enable us to gauge more accurately the cost of doing the works and to facilitate the negotiation so that we can come to an agreement on the lump sum for the superstructure in the coming months. We are also actively negotiating with the contractor on the intrusion protection barrier. 
We have 15 miles of intrusion protection barrier. Um, some of this is earth and berm, and more of it is standalone wall. And we also have some crash walls at Kineho and Thule. We are we just completed a two-day negotiating session last week, and we are going back down to Selma to continue negotiating in the second week of December. There are two other big disputes. We've got the Deer Creek Viaduct and the Cross Creek Viaduct. We are, we are scheduling to commence negotiate negotiations on these intensive negotiations in December. When we resolve all these disputes, this will put us in a much better position with the Dragatis Pattern contract. Resolution of these issues will reset this contract. Next slide, please. Okay. This shows the unmitigated risks. Uh, yep, right away acquisition for the critical utilities, uh, third party coordination, timely design approvals. And obviously, the big issue is the resolution of the commercial disputes. So, we're working to finalize the right away agreements for utility relocations. And Dennis and his team are, are helping us here. And so is Frank Baca and Gareth Fernandez. We have established, as Brian said earlier, a third party task force, which where we've appointed an executive director to focus on each key stakeholder to expedite resolution of any outstanding issues. And we are actively negotiating commercial settlements. We have a negotiating team of six members and we are actively negotiating the outstanding disputes. Next slide. Okay, I'm finished. So it's over to Garth Fernandez. Thank you, Daniel. Before we uh, hand it to Garth, let me just transition to him. That's the status of where we stand on the construction elements. Uh, and then as uh, I think board members know, we've also doing work in the Valley outside of construction with the extension toward Merced through the adoption of the Central Valley Y. Uh, that also included important agreements with the city of uh, Fairmead, uh, County of Madera, uh, City of Chowchilla, uh, City of Madera, Chowchilla Elementary School District. And Garth really was our point person on advancing those settlements. Uh, I'm going to let Garth walk through that. But um, uh, again, this is now starting to look at the work forward beyond construction in the valley. Uh, what do we, you know, the work we get, we're getting done to complete the environmental and then transition into the next steps there. So with that, Garth, you want to just uh, go through where you are. Sure. Well, thanks, Brian. Um, good afternoon, board members. Uh, Garth Fernandez, uh, I'm the Central Valley Regional Director. And I'm going to highlight uh, a couple of areas that has been our focus to ensure continued delivery of the 119 and plan for the extensions to Mercer to Bakersfield. So as you may know, the Central Valley Y segment was approved by the board last year in September. But since that time, we've had to toll the statute of limitations under CEQA with multiple stakeholders and local agencies so that we could resolve issues they had highlighted under the threat of litigation. Well, the good news is Brian reported we were able to get agreement on all of the issues. And um, in September this year with the city of Madera, we eliminated all CEQA risk for this segment. So we do have a two year NEPA statute of limitations that expires in 2022. So as you can see from the list below, we had six separate agreements that resolved all these issues. So the first three on that list with the Fairmead Community and Friends, the City of Chowchilla and the County of Madeira were to address environmental justice mitigations included in the document pertaining to the community of Fairmead. So through the environmental process, the authority worked closely with the community of Fairmead to identify potential mitigation measures that would meet the needs and wishes of the community. And then in conjunction, the authority negotiated with the city of Chowchilla and the county of Madeira to agreements for the implementation of said measures. So some of the improvements we have committed to that will provide significant benefits to the community of Fairmead were, you know, assisting in developing a sewer connection from the city of Chowchilla wastewater treatment facility to Fairmead, currently the residences in the community do not have a public sewer and rely on a septic tank system. Uh, we've contributed to ensuring a clean, reliable drinking source. Um, the county has already implemented this by installing a new well for the community. 
Uh, we are in the process of construction of a community facility, including a public library, a meeting space, outdoor facilities in Fairmead. Now, this will be constructed, owned, and operated by the County of Madeira, and they are moving forward with procuring a designer to start that process. And lastly, improvements to the community infrastructure itself. We're talking about drainage, we're talking about improvements to the roads, sidewalks, lighting, signage, all of those to be implemented in our con follow on construction contract when we do the Y. The next two agreements are with the city of Chowchula and, and the city of Madeira, and they are for specific city issues related to the direct HSR impacts. And lastly, the Chowchula Elementary School District Agreement was to mitigate the required rerouting of bus routes. Next slide, please. If I could just jump in for a second there, uh, Garth. Uh, board members, particularly board members uh, Richards and Shank, um, uh, this is really significant, the execution of those agreements. And I, I just wanna say why. As you guys know, where we have approved environmental documents in the past, uh, many times it's been met with CEQA litigation. And what Garth has achieved through these agreements is at least with respect to CEQA, uh, the Y uh, adoption, the Y uh, rod uh, uh, will not see the CEQA litigation that we saw in the prior, uh, some of the prior uh, environmental documents. So that is a, uh, that, that's refreshing and, uh, and a well-earned and, and, and hard won uh, victory. And uh, I just want to spend a minute to commend Garth on the patience and the work he did along with our legal team. Uh, Kendall, uh, in, in some of those, Lisa Crowfoot was a big help on that. Of course, Le Alicia Fowler under her direction. But yeah, that's significant to to adopt the environmental documents and, and be at a place where we're not going to see the sequel litigation. We do have some risk still on the NEPA side because that timeline is longer. Uh, but the CEQA uh, timeline has uh, have has, has elapsed and, and without without litigation. I just think that's really significant. Well, th th thank you for underscoring it. Yes, for those of us who've been in those battles for a very long time, this is refreshing, as you say, and a new day. And uh, thank you, thank you, Garth. You're welcome. Thanks, Brian. Go ahead, Garth. <laughs> So the next uh, area I want to highlight for you is is a good story for the for the for, for the authority. It's the partnership we have with the city of Selma, and in, in creating a Central Valley Training Center that provides pre-apprenticeship training to develop the skills and credentials of the local workforce. Um, so the goal is to enhance local employment opportunities for the underserved communities in the Central Valley. So this training center provides students customized instruction and job placement assistance. Uh, so the program was created to fulfill some of our CEQA mitigation obligations and to address impacts on environmental justice populations. Additionally, the program will also help preparing the labor force needed throughout the construction of the high-speed rail and other projects in the Central Valley. So we have completed three cohorts last year. We have graduated 54 students. Students graduate, they are now eligible to get to, to the halls in their apprenticeship program and start working uh, you know, directly on the, on the high speed rail project. You know, they, they get certain certifications as they go through this pre-apprenticeship program. You know, they do confined space entry, they do OSHA, they do forklift training. So all of these are, are certifications that definitely help them to, to get and be competitive in the workforce. So we are right now currently in the process of extending this program for another year. And we're also applying for a CRISI grant, that is the Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvement Program to further extend this program for multiple years so we can keep this going. Garth, are we, are we, are we, are we tracking this uh, with the graduates with regards to job placements? Yes, we are. And, and, and there's a report that we, that we it comes out the EDC that's the, has help in in the in the job placement services for the program, and we track how how we are doing on that on a continual basis. Would you make sure that information is is provided to the board members? Definitely. Thank you, Garth. Uh, this is Lynn. Do you know is there an urban core in the area? Uh, the, the, there are urban cores in. Uh, the Bay Area, and I'm the founding mother of the one here in San Diego uh, some decades ago. And it, it's 
it just seems that if there is, this is a uh, would be great synergy with the urban core, uh, where it takes at risk youth and uh, provides not just job training, but life training while they're getting job training. And it's ongoing and it's a pipeline of the graduates go on to get you know, pretty good jobs. Um, so if there is one in that area, you know, I, I would um, bring to your attention to maybe see a, seek a connection. And if there isn't one, uh, well, I'll talk to you offline about maybe how we can start one. Sure. Well, thanks for that. Um, Garth, question? Yes, um, Margaret. Thank you. Um, do you know how long they track um, graduates of the program? Like, do they just track them while they're in the high-speed rail, um, working for high-speed rail, or do they track them beyond high-speed rail? It'd be interesting to see to track individuals that go through the program and be interesting to track them 10, 20 years. Just curious. Well, we have we have any initiated this program now for the first year. And so as part of the program, we have a one year placement and tracking service that goes along with that. So mm -hmm. we haven't got to that full first year as yet, but that's something that we should we should be able to to do to be able to track uh, all of the all of our graduates through the program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, next slide, please. So the, this is, is, is one partnership that I'm, I'm very proud of. We worked real hard with the city of Vasco to get to where we are. Uh, it's the most improved relationship we have with, the, with, with a local agency. Last year, we were at a standstill. Um, you know, as, a city, as the Vasco city manager in his comments earlier indicated, we have made significant progress in our relationship. And that has allowed us to for the work to progress. So earlier this month, we had two locations with outstanding permits. Well, since then, the pedestrian underpass for Amtrak was issued by the city already. We have worked with the city on POSO, that's the last location, and the city is agreeable to split this location into two permits, thereby allowing us to advance the construction. So the permit for phase one and two is on track to be issued in the next couple of days. And I'm meeting with the city directly after this call to ensure we can continue to, to get that permit. And uh, phase three and four is scheduled for early next year. So we've also made significant progress with the city on several other agreements that were, that were actually going nowhere. The operations and maintenance agreement, great separation agreement, and a right-of-way transfer agreement, all to be executed early next year. So the last agreement on the list um, that we're looking at is, is the one we are working on right now, and that's a partnership agreement with the city. So this agreement is for the city to perform work required by the project within the city's jurisdiction. And this was something what the city manager was alluding to earlier in his public comment. So all these locations are off our alignment, do not constrain the completion of the corridor, but it gives the opportunity for the city to truly be a partner with this project and help us be successful in delivery. And then finally, um, you know, as Brian reported earlier, this presentation, the federal race grant, uh, will address some of their concerns of demolition of the former Wasco farm working housing and then the widening of State Route 46 that we're going to do with Caltrans. So all of this does help us fulfill our commitment to the city that when we are done with this project, we will leave their community in a position that is equal or better than when we started. And so with that, that's the end of my presentation. If there are any other questions, I'll be happy to answer. I don't see any, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Garth. Um, I'm sorry, Garth. I apologize. The last page here of the Central Valley update here, the last slide, is uh, an update on where we are in some of the station planning. We have four key station areas in the Central Valley, Bakersfield, the King Solari Station, Fresno, and Merced. I think Meg Cedaroth is, is on this, and uh, Meg, I'd ask you to take this up and just uh, provide a, a brief summary of uh, the work we're doing in this area and um, uh, and then take any questions from the board members here. Yes, 
Thank you, Brian. Yes. So the planning team, of course, works statewide, but in the Central Valley, the team's work is a very clear focus on delivery milestones as we advance towards passenger service on the initial operating segment. The team's been engaged with each jurisdiction over the past year on a range of topics that fall loosely under the heading of pre-design planning work. And we focus very specifically on how the station site is integrated into the surrounding uh, station context, city context. So these conversations, of course, vary by station. And although the Central Valley is a really distinct region in the state, we certainly appreciate that each station location is quite different and has a very unique context. So in addition to each station being environmentally cleared, there still remains um, some important coordination work necessary with each of these jurisdictions in order to clarify questions about access facilities, such as the location of pickup and drop off facilities or linkages to planned um, or, or new bikeways, as well as sidewalk networks and active transportation networks, as well as the location and the layout of parking facilities, and then important coordination with local and regional transit providers to understand the need for layover spaces and facilities and make sure that the routings are really starting to achieve that integrated and seamless network of transportation that we envision at the station sites. So in Fresno, Kings Tulare, and Bakersfield, this work reflects um, a logical next step um, or next stage of project delivery and fits within the context of the station area planning work, that land use planning work that the authority funded previously. We also, I want to emphasize that the engagement with these stakeholders in each location is very closely coordinated with Garth and his team, in particular, his deputy, Tony Tinoco, without whom we wouldn't have the quality and the breadth of the partnerships and the relationships that we need in order for these stations to fit well within the city context. So next steps for each of the four stations vary by station. And Bakersfield will be very focused on coordinating with the city um, and the Department of Public Works, as well as Caltrans on the design and layout of access facilities, in particular, the 204 and F Street interchange. In Kings Tulare, we are focused very much on coordinating with the local just jurisdictions on their land use and active, tr active transportation access planning. The city of Hanford is looking to update their general plan in order to accommodate and address the station location. In Fresno, I think you heard at the FNA committee meeting, we'll be um, very focused on um, one portion of the station complex, and that's the historic uh, historic Fresno station facility, which will be doing um, accessibility and seismic retrofit design work for that historic facility, as well as closely coordinating with a number of stakeholders in the area and the city on potential uses for the adjacent vacant site that can be done in advance of high-speed rail service, as well as ongoing um, planning work for the future high-speed rail station facility itself. And then in Merced, we will be coordinating with the city on adjusting the scope of work that um, they're working under in order to do an update to a general plan or specific plan to accommodate the station and be a supportive partner in that work as well as coordinate with the San Joaquin JPA and the city on the station location. And then of course, you'll notice on the screen, there's one other dot there that's unlabeled. That's the Madera station that the San Joaquin JPA are working to relocate right now. So all of this work is, la is laying the groundwork for a future station design contract in 2022. Thank you, Meg. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if there's, um, I don't know if there's any questions for board members, but that concludes the Central Valley uh, update. And uh, we can either take questions or move to the next uh, item. Thank you, uh, Brian. Any questions from uh, any of, of the members? I would only say that uh, it's thorough and, uh, and clear um, presentation, Brian, and I think it's this has to be as helpful for the other members as it is to me, and to see it in a concise uh, a presentation like this brings a lot of uh, clarity to questions that you can have uh, when you see it piece by piecemeal. So thank you very much. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We look forward to next month with uh, Southern California. Yep. Perfect. That's next. Okay. And that's a good transition to the next item. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, item number three today is Burbank to Los Angeles EIR -E 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 update. And um, Brian will uh, let you introduce this also. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Serge Stanich is the Director of our Environmental Services. I know the board members know Serge well from the presentations on prior uh, uh, ROD discussions that were before the board, uh, records of decisions, certifications before the board. Um, and I just want to say as we get into this, um, uh, coming up in January, this is just sort of a high level look for the board of what we're going to be bringing you at the two day hearing in January. I think we have that scheduled for the January 19th and 20th. Uh, but that is the, the really the second rod that we're bringing for Southern California. Uh, for the our last one, you'll recall Palmdale to uh, Bakersfield to Palmdale. Uh, now this one is the Burbank to Los Angeles uh, segment. It's about a 14 mile segment to defined stations on the north and south part of it. LA Union Station on the south, Burbank Airport Station in the north. Um, and Serge is just going to walk through a high level kind of where we are on this, what will be, be coming before the board uh, in January. But I, I do want to emphasize, again, we picked up the pace on the environmental document reviews. The board has done a tremendous job in, in identifying initially preferred alternatives that allowed us to get the drafts out. This is indeed a statewide uh, project. We now uh, have approved about 300 miles in terms of clearing the environmental documents. 300 miles of the 500 mile system. We'll bring you this second one in LA County uh, in January. And in March, we're scheduled to bring the extension from Merced to San Jose. And in May, the San Jose to San Francisco. And so at that point, middle of 2022, we'll have cleared, if, if assuming that all of this gets approved, we'll have cleared some 430 miles of the 500 mile segment. And again, uh, re-emphasizing the, the fact that this is a statewide 500 mile uh, project. And uh, this environmental work getting done is the first step to allowing us to then advance the, advanced, uh, advance the design work uh, so that we can configure the system, refine costs, uh, identify right away, move earlier on utility relocations and those types of things. So uh, this is no small item and I, I'm just uh, so pleased that we keep coming back to the board to advance the environmental work. It's such an important precursor to get into the next stages of this project all up and down the state. So with that, Serge, I wanna hand it to you and let you uh, do that do the work on uh, this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, members of the board. Uh, it's my honor to uh, present to you this overview uh, the staff are very excited about this important milestone um, of bringing the Burbank Los Angeles project section, finally IR EIS, uh, to the board for your consideration approval in January. <clears throat> Can we move to the next slide, please? So as Brian mentioned, this is a very high level overview of the project section and what we'll be bringing forward to you. So uh, Burbank Los Angeles is uh, the first project section entirely within LA County and in Southern California. Uh, Bakersfield to Palmdale just kind of touched into LA County, but this one is really in the urban area. So it's approximately 14 miles long. We'll be uh, constructing two or adding two electrified tracks in the existing corridor. The corridor is owned by Metro, but operated uh, by Metrolink and Amtrak in the corridor. Project has two stations at Burbank Airport, which would be below ground, uh, and then connecting to the Los Angeles Union Station. So uh, the LA station is an existing facility that will provide some modifications to bring our track work in there, but the Burbank station would be a new station underneath and adjacent to the future terminal for the Burbank uh, Airport. We have two project uh, alternatives that we've considered, uh, a build alternative and a no build alternative. Uh, we went through extensive uh, screening of alternatives over the last uh, 10 years in developing this alternative and identified the one build alternative that stays within the uh, existing corridor to be the superior alternative as it reduces the potential effects <clears throat> to the communities and to the infrastructure in the area. So uh, this brings quite a few benefits to the LA um, 
area for transit and mobility. It'll improve the operational elements of the existing <coughs> corridor and improve passenger and freight services. Uh, it improves safety uh, for the area by including a number of grade separations, as well as adding elements like positive train control. Uh, it'll reduce VMT and then improve emissions as we're providing electrified passenger service. Um, and then also we are providing the infrastructure that will accommodate uh, the anticipated 2018 uh, state rail plan. So we can provide the, the infrastructure for other service providers such as Metrolink or Amtrak uh, to provide service on our corridor. Now, we're not clearing their activities, but we do provide the, uh, the facilities or the infrastructure that could accommodate that. Can we move to the next slide, please? Actually, I apologize. So let's go back just one slide so that we can use the visual on this. Um, and so uh, the color coding can show most of this alignment will be at grade, but a portion of it goes underneath the Burbank Airport. So we have two color codes here. Uh, green is at grade and purple is underneath so that it will be constructed underground. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a general overview of the statistics. It's roughly 14 miles, and the majority of which, a uh, little over seven, um, are at grade. And then we have um, uh, almost two miles that are below grade. This is at the airport. And then we have some uh, retained fill portions or areas that are along the Metro uh, Link corridor uh, where we have to modify the grades. Uh, we have several crossings of the LA River and other um, um, water features that are going through the urban area there, and 32 road crossings. Most of those road crossings are already grade separated, uh, but we have a couple that we're going to have to close, and then five that we're able to provide grade separations, thereby eliminating any of the at grade crossings. So this will be a fully grade separated rail corridor. Next slide, please. I want to give a history of this project because um, there's just been so much work that's gone on to this. The program started with the, uh, the program document that was approved in 2005 that laid out the overall route from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And then in 2008, there was a second program EIR that resolved um, the alignment uh, through from the Bay Area to the Central Valley through the Pacheco area. Then in 2010 to 2014, we started developing alternatives. And at that time, this project section, Burbank to LA, was part of a larger consideration from Palmdale to Los Angeles. And due to the conflicts that were and the challenges that were identified of going through the Angeles National Forest, as well as the downtown urban area, it really made sense to split them up into two project sections so that we could focus on the resource issues and then also still have the independent utility of providing that station at Burbank. So we have two project sections there. Uh, Brian didn't touch on this, but uh, that other uh, section, Palmdale to Burbank, is one of the uh, other project sections in Southern California. And we are looking forward to publishing that draft in early 2022 as well. So that's coming on the horizon. Uh, so uh, we split out the Burbank to LA project section and then in 2014 began really focused scoping for the Burbank to Los Angeles project section and then refining the alternatives that included how we are going to grade sap or coordinate going through and under the uh, Burbank airport. So in 2018, uh, let's see, November of 2018, we came to the board seeking approval of the preferred alternative in that meeting back in November 2018. We also did Palmdale to Burbank, uh, Burbank to LA and LA to Anaheim. Uh, and then from that point coordinated for the publication of the draft uh, last summer in 2020. Uh, during that time, uh, the COVID pandemic had erupted. We normally do a 45 day public comment period, but um, due to the challenges of having in-person meetings and making this information available to the public, that comment period was extended to, to over 90 days. And so here we are in 2021 and we have published the final EIR EIS. So the next slide, please. Um, we published the final on November 5th, and that was just a couple of weeks ago, I think. And uh, NEPA requires a 30-day wait period before we're able to act and approve that document. Um, so that will close on December 6th. And uh, as we 
uh, experienced in Bakersfield Pondale. We anticipate that the public will provide some comments, some uh, expressing concerns, some expressing uh, support, uh, and some asking for some clarifications. And so as part of that, we will prepare our decision documents that we'll be coming to the board with in January. So in December 6th through 10th that week, we'll make ourselves available for briefings to board members where we'll go over uh, the document, what's in there, the impacts and the environmental effects that are considered, and the mitigation measures or uh, related commitments to offset those impacts. Then on January 7th, we will begin uh, publishing that information, those decision documents and the materials that'll go before the board. Um, and then on January 13th through 18th, we'll be available again for any other briefings to the board members that they may ask before we go into the actual board meeting. Again, we'll have a two-day board meeting to, uh, to present to the board, uh, hear public uh, comment, and then reconvene to address that. So uh, the next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, the same slide as we presented to the board in August. This is the set of actions that we are asking the board to consider. Uh, the board, as the governing body for the authority, will be asking them to certify our final EIR, EIS, as the sequel lead agency, and then also approving the project, approving the preferred alternative and the related CEQA decision documents. Those will include the mitigation monitoring and reporting plan, uh, as well as the findings of fact and statement of overriding considerations. And then uh, as part of that, the uh, NEPA assignment provisions um, have the CEO signing the record of decision. So upon approval by the board, the board would then direct the CEO to sign the record of decision. And uh, the next slide, please. And that concludes our brief presentation, just to give you an overview of the Burbank LA project section and what will be coming before you. But I'm available for any questions. Do you, Serge, any questions for uh, Mr. Stanich? Yes, Alain? Well, not a, not a question, just a, a comment. Uh, and for <laughs> our new members, uh, Serge, you know, has there ever step of the way since 2005? And so some of your history was bringing back, it brought back painful memories uh, of the, some of the challenges that, that we were facing. And so even though this is just the high level appetizer introduction uh, to next month, uh, I'm very excited about it. You know, for a long time, I was the only Southern California member on the board and uh, getting lots of questions from LA to San Diego about when are we going to see any movement towards the south and so um, I, you're excited I think I may be even more excited so thank you for this and I look forward to next month thank you director thank you Lynn any other uh, comments or questions yes Henry Mr. Chairman thank you for that I, I wanted to wait to the end of this uh, presentation just some highlights or bullets uh, bullet points that Brian and I spoke about yesterday in the briefing. I mean, first, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very grateful that a lot of the building trades folks were on today. Uh, it was it was good to hear the support that we have from, from the building trades. Um, and what, what underscored my attention to them today was, I mean, clearly they were they were very interested in delivering a message to us, to the governor, to the legislature that we stay the course. <clears throat> that we continue building out the vision of the governor to do the 171 miles, and I believe we we are on that path. But uh, but also obviously it underscores the challenges that they see at those levels because there are folks up there who would like to see money move from the valley to other parts of the state, and I understand you know they're 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 wanting to do that. Um, but you know those those things will be worked out by our CEO working with the legislature and the governor to to hammer out whatever that final deal may be. But coming to our responsibility as a board, it's to get the project done. And then I think staff today has done a great job of of showing how they're kind of retooling, repositioning themselves to give us and the legislature and the people of California and the governor a, a much clearer, better picture of when things are going to get done. That's why, you know, I focus a lot of my questions on, on timelines, critical paths, uh, deadlines. I mean, we have an R deadline that 
Uh, thankfully, the, the federal government now is gonna give us more time to complete that section of the project. But to do that, we have to know when third party agreements will be settled, when right away will be acquired and everything that goes with it. But I think we attach that to all of the great things that, that all the folks have done in constructing what we've done to date. It's amazing. And we did it all because of hard work by our staff, hard work by those folks on the ground. But as board members, I think we just have to be more honed, I believe, at least I will for myself, is to hold myself more accountable to giving staff the policy direction that we have to give, to, to let them do their jobs and to accept and review their recommendations on how they need to get the job done and, and believe in them and support them to do it. But going forward, I think it's critical that we hold people accountable to whatever timelines and or dates that they give us and the people of California to get this project done. So, I mean, I'm looking forward to the, the information in the next few months and, and our hopefully our May revise will have the information that we can clearly and confidently give to the state legislature and the governor saying, this is where we're at, this is where we're gonna get these sections completed and that we all hold hands and, and we live with the, you know, with the deadlines that we create because we, we can't continue moving forward giving deadlines that we can't meet or costs that, that keep escalating. We, we have to be as more clear, as clear as we can in moving this project forward. So Brian, thank you for what you do. Your staff, you did a great job today. I'm, I'm very hopeful and confident that we're gonna have those answers in the next few months. Thank you, Henry. Thanks, Henry. Thanks, Henry. Any other comments? All right, uh, seeing, seeing none, then thank you. Uh, We'll now move on to uh, the fourth item on our agenda, which is the CEO report, uh, Brian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna cover uh, one, two, three, four, five areas in the CEO report. Uh, one is an update on the federal funding uh, situation. As mo most board members know, significant legislation was passed at the federal level. I think it's all because Tom and I went back to Washington. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <Thanks. laughs> But it was, uh, it, it's it's a very, very good first step. There's a second bill that's pending that uh, we have great interest in. I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll do a brief summary of the congressional stakeholder meetings. Uh, I, I do want to report to the board the recently executed change order, one that we discussed in, in a closed session before, but that that has been executed. And then our board member Camacho asked me to touch on two additional issues, the track and systems uh, update and um, issues around industry input on any conflict of interest requests uh, or clarity they're looking for in that area as we prepare for the uh, uh, the uh, rail delivery partner RFQ that's scheduled to come to for the board uh, next month. Um, and so I want to comment on, on those things. So uh, just getting into the, the, the presentation now, if you go to the next slide, uh, you know, the president signed the uh, uh, the recent infrastructure, what was called the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And uh, while uh, folks had pointed out that, gee, there's nothing specific in there for high-speed rail uh, per se, uh, you know, this bill has on the order of $58 billion in new funding uh, above baseline figures for a, a variety of federal funding pots, many of which we intend to compete in and we have competed in. For example, the RAISE grant that we're uh, it looks like we're going to get for uh, Wasco is one that now will have a billion and a half more in it every year for the next five years. The bill on in total is the biggest investment in passenger rail in 50 years, biggest investment in roads and bridges in 70 years, and the biggest investment ever uh, in public transit. So it's a very significant uh, funding bill with, with a lot of opportunity uh, for the authority. Next slide. This is a chart that I had showed before when these bills were pending. And I, I just wanna to return to it because again, there are one, two, three, four, five, six different pots contained in this bill with on the order of 57 plus billion dollars in uh, funding that's really above what was gonna be the baseline funding for these programs uh, going forward. And these are all pots that we will be playing in and that we do play in uh, for federal funding. So even in the National Intercity Passenger Rail pot, um, there's an amount in here where uh, high-speed rail is clearly uh, eligible to participate and seek 
uh, funding, uh, Chrissy grants, infra grants, raise grants. These are all places uh, where we have uh, applied for funding in the past, been awarded some funds in the past, and it will intend to compete in those going forward. So this is a very significant bill. You know, outside of my time at the authority, I've been working in transportation policy for 26 years now in California. And the fed, for the federal government to step up and put this level of funding on the table is truly historic. And I, I think a lot of the cover uh, coverage of the act and the work back there is focused on how are they gonna get the votes and when are they gonna get the votes? And what's been missed is the substance of the, the product itself. And it is massive with huge opportunities for California. I suspect that you're gonna hear more from Governor Newsom as he comes out with his budget proposal in January and exactly how the state will interact with these federal funds uh, to invest in our infrastructure going forward. But this is a huge, huge development for California. And I think for this project going forward. Next slide. Uh, obviously, I kind of covered this, but California is uniquely positioned to lever leverage these funds. High-speed rail has both cap and trade and our bond dollars here that we can use to match federal dollars. Uh, there are other state and regional projects of significance. And because California raises a lot of its own funds through SB1 and regional and local agencies do through local sales taxes for transportation, uh, we again, we stand in a very strong place uh, to uh, to match these federal dollars and put them to work in California. We're working to develop a coordinate, coordinated statewide strategy to build the best possible outcomes for California and for this project. That's something we're in uh, real-time discussions with the governor's office on. So again, next steps will be establishing, I'm sorry, go back, uh, establishing some of those strategic priorities for this project. Uh, we'll look at uh, screening some of the HSR project for priority and, and aligning the right funding sources to make sure we can take advantage of these. And we can collaborate with state and regional transportation agencies on those projects that have mutual benefit for both uh, local projects and as well as this project. There's a lot of opportunity for joint benefit uh, projects. Next, next slide. Uh, aside from that bill, there is still uh, a bill pending, which was been referred to as the reconciliation bill at the federal level. It's also called the Build Back Better Act, and that has infrastructure funding in it that's well beyond transportation. I would describe it as including human infrastructure, uh, as well as uh, things like, um, uh, I think, digital divide issues and, and other, uh, an array of government programs uh, in it. I think in total, it's a, on the order of 1.8 trillion in investments at the federal level. That also includes a dedicated $10 billion program specifically for high-speed rail and trains that can go at speeds above 160 and 186 miles per hour. A designated funding would provide up to 90% federal match toward high-speed rail planning and capital projects. And uh, we expect the Build Back Better Act will be taken up uh, in the House uh, first, then go back to the Senate for some uh, for lack of a better term, massaging, and uh, and we, uh, I think the schedule in Washington right now is for this to be completed in December. And so again, we're hoping that the, uh, obviously the high-speed rail funding part stays in this, but this is additive to what we described in the first bill. This is an important uh, project and program for us. Next slide. Uh, Tom and I were recently back in Washington, D.C. at the beginning of the uh, the month. Uh, just a brief summary of that. We, as Tom mentioned, we did have an opportunity to talk to our partners at the Federal Railroad Administration. We did discuss the importance of the raise grant as well as uh, the pending legislation back there and what it meant to us. We met with 12 ind individual congressional uh, members on both the Senate uh, and the House side. Uh, we did two stakeholder roundtable meetings, one with labor at the national level, including leaders of the California labor uh, delegation. Uh, and we also met with the uh, National American Public Transit Association. Uh, Congressman C uh, Costa, who's always been a lead for us uh, back there, was instrumental in getting us meetings with uh, the New Democrats group, and as well as Congressman Moulton, who's been an a advocate for high-speed rail. And so uh, in about four days, we covered a lot of ground, um, and uh, the trip was... Uh, Obviously, it feels good when you come back from a trip like that and you're awarded a raise grant a couple of weeks later and they pass a huge infrastructure bill. So it certainly felt like and was, I think, a successful 
a trip. And, and I was impressed, I will say, with, I think, what is a lot of positive energy about expanding high-speed rail nationally uh, in the halls of uh, Congress and obviously in the administration. So I, I thought it was a very uh, good trip. Uh, next slide. Uh, I did, we have talked to the, in the, uh, with the board in the closed session about how we're advancing the superstructure on the Hanford Viaduct. In fact, that picture on the right there shows the substructure for that viaduct. And now we're in negotiations to get the superstructure or the, or if you will, the track uh, part on top of that substructure. We did execute a time and materials uh, contract to get the work uh, going. We will uh, work closely with the contractor and oversee the contractor's work there to monitor uh, pace of production, cost rates, all of that, uh, so that we can execute the second part of the full lump sum amount to get that work going. But we did execute this uh, time and materials contract at $50 million uh, that was approved last Friday at the executive uh, board meeting. And so again, uh, now we uh, get to work on this and uh, we work toward uh, negotiating the final elements of that, that structure. Uh, next slide. Uh, Ernie asked for an update on the track and systems procurement. And so um, here's what I can tell you. And I'm, of course, I'm happy to answer any questions about any of this, but uh, we have two active bidders that are continuing to be engaged with the authority and can continue to work with them to respond to their uh, questions and prepare uh, for bids. We anticipate their bid proposals will now come in uh, around April of 2022. Um, we anticipate recommendation of contract award to the board in July of 2022 and uh, anticipate a first notice to proceed uh, come August of 2022. So that's the current status of the track and system procurement. Um, I'll go to the next slide and then I'll happy to answer questions about any of these. Uh, uh, board member Camacho also asked about where we are on engaging with industry and the request for qualifications relative to the project delivery services. Th those are services that are now provided to us by WSP. That contract expires in June of 2022. And so we are entering a re-procurement. We are preparing to come back to the board in either December or January uh, to have the board approve us moving forward with that RFQ. And uh, as we have reached out to industry on a couple of occasions uh, uh, in August, and again in September, we met with 10 different uh, entities involved or wanting to be involved in this procurement. And we, uh, we indicated to them that uh, if they have any concerns about uh, the activities that they do and whether or not that presents a conflict for them to participate in the RFQ, uh, that uh, they should submit those inquiries to our legal office. And we would work to give them a, a review of that and answer their questions. We have received seven requests for legal review related to those uh, issues. And our legal team is has in some cases requested documents from the contractors and they've started that review so that they can be informed on uh, steps they either may have to take or issues they may have to address to be able to participate uh, in the RFQ. And so that's uh, that's the status of where that is on that particular question. And I think that uh, that is the conclusion of uh, all that matters that I wanted to update in the CEO report. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Ernie? Ernie, you're on mute. You're muted there, Ernie. There, right. is that better? Yep. The Is the conflict of interest issue applying to the track and systems contract as well as the RDP? Or is it I not? mean, there were, well, track and systems is already out to bid. And so okay. issues of conflict of interest were raised much earlier on that and those, those discussions were had and resolved. Uh, and so, mm -hmm. Now with this pending RFQ, which has a lot of, as I think as you know, a lot of industry interest yeah. on the, the pending uh, project delivery services contract, uh, that's where we've now gotten seven different inquiries about potential conflicts that our legal team is working with those entities to review. Well, Brian, I have attended several uh, industry briefings as well, either through the CMMA or, or other uh, associations. And one of the questions that continues to be raised to me is it, in order to put together a team to be responsive to RFP and RFQ, it takes a great deal of time to do that. Yep. And it takes a great deal of money to do it as well. Yep. It's time, energy, and it's money being spent having people come in from all, all parts of uh, the country. So it, 
have we actually resolved some of the issues of conflict of interest or were those still pending only because as they put together a team they may have a specific firm they can provide a yep. specific expertise yep. and so, me, oh, sorry sorry no, Ernie, go ahead. Just, they're in limbo many of them because they don't know if, whether yeah. or not the, the conflict is going to knock them out yeah well listen i on the question of being in limbo um we have been very clear with industry through our outreach um uh uh with industry both directly in august and again in september uh, any issues that they see or have concerns with um, in the in this area to raise with our legal team and we will review the matter with them and give them the advice on that before as they prepare to uh, participate in this process. So again, we're having the discussions with those that are raising the issues uh, in real time uh, right now with our legal team and some of the industry who have raised those questions. Some have raised questions directly with me and I've referred them to legal. And so they are evaluating that, communicating with them uh, so that uh, any uh, areas of conflict for them, uh, they can take steps to resolve and either continue to participate uh, in the thing or, uh, or or perhaps not, depending on what the, what the conflict is. So our team is really working with them to evaluate the issues and they're so individual depending on sure. who the firm is and what the issue is. But we are in active discussions with them. We have invited, and I would invite any of them now to raise uh, any concerns that they have about it or things they're seeing that they're concerned about. And uh, and, and we are providing them with uh, 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 review and comment and communicating with them on the issues. And so uh, ultimately they'll make a judgment and uh, take actions to deal with the conflict matter. But I think, you know, you and I have discussed this before and obviously what we're, what we want to achieve is, you know, we want to make sure the conflicts are resolved, but we also want to make sure we have a very vibrant and vital uh, uh, a bid process. With well, a lot, that, of that's that was the issue. Is yeah. that, we, that I mean, it's, there's no, um, it's not competition if only one firm, one group of firms submit. So right. we're trying to encourage uh, several firms to submit so that we get, you know, the competent and competitive bids. But right. what I think I'm hearing, and I'm, you know, I'm not certain, but I, I uh, this is the case in every case, but many of the firms that have submitted things to our legal team, um, the, there has been no response. So they're still in limbo. So I would just encourage you to have our legal people uh, get on top of those so that, you know, they can, they can be responsive and get those issues clarified. Well, here, here's what I can Brian, tell you. If I I might. Mean, oh, Brian, if I might. Sure. Board Member Camacho, each of the requests that have come in, we have responded, let the teams know we've received these requests. We're working to finalize the scope of the contract. And we, until we have a scope finalized, we can't actually complete the conflict review, but we can reach out and ask for more documents and more information to the extent the requests came in with okay. not enough information. So, so, so we're still absolutely waiting. in the middle of that. I get it. So we're still waiting on scope in order to be able to respond. Correct. For that someone. doesn't stop us from that's, reaching out. That, we have reached out and yeah. we have asked them to send more information. Right, and that's what the hang up is, I believe, then, is because we're still waiting on some on a portion on our side, so we can't respond back to them. But in the interim, the date is static and 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 we're they're losing time in terms of putting together a competent and competitive team. That's all I'm saying. I believe uh, I hear, I hear the issue, Ernie, and I'm just going to say this. I believe that we are operating in a way that uh, they will all have uh, the uh, responses that they need from us to put together uh, their proposal and their team to meet the request. And, and, so, and, and we, as I said in the report, we've had seven specific requests come in. Mm -hmm. We are communicating with those firms directly and in some cases seeking additional documentation and we are answering those questions and it's true we'll finalize the scope and we'll continue to work through them with them on any perceived conflicts that they may see or have questions about and we and we'll continue to communicate with those firms on the issues and alicia then i can refer any of those questions or people write to you then to respond to that yes please that would be you. perfect Ernie, uh tom from what i have done i certainly have not had as many 
uh, contacts is, as, as you have, or not, or not that you've had it, but they've had with you. But I, I, have, I have always just made it a policy. I, I, had, I had forward them to the appropriate person on, in, uh, in management. Um, part of what I've been concerned about also is I don't want to get into a position where anybody ends up being compromised because they're talking to a board member and we're subsequently going to be voting on whoever gets selected. So I've always been Tom, concerned. Tom, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a rule on that, and that's not until there's the, the proposals have been submitted. Up before yeah. that, there is no problem. Well, you know, maybe I'm being too cautious, but that's kind of the way I've I've handled it. No, but, no I, but I, I, I appreciate your saying that. I should probably look into it, but that that's kind of what I was advised a long time ago. So that I just carried that forward. But no, there's a blackout period once proposals are being are submitted. Yeah. But I'm talking about terms that teams that have not yet submitted. No, I, I agree, and that yeah, I, and, I, and, I, and they need. You know they're 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 reluctant to submit because they're 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 they see a time frame yeah. uh, where some of their team partners may be uh, an intricate part of their proposal and they can't reach out to them because yeah. they're they uh, don't know whether or not they're conflicted or not. Ernie, if I could just say this, um, I've had some people ra entities raise it directly with me, and I've asked them to uh, direct direct I've directed them to counsel. And in every case, counsel is responding to those issues. Well, so I, I, if you're getting the same. No, it was yeah. it was Alicia. So now I know. Yeah, it's Alicia. Yep. Okay, good points. But thank thanks, Ernie, on that. Um, anything else for Brian on his CEO report? Hearing nothing or seeing no no one who has any. Let me just move quickly into uh, a quick uh, summary of where we were in finance and audit today. I think that you would uh, understand that I'll, I'll, I'm not going to say much about the, the Central Valley construction update because of the, uh, the uh, information you received already. With regards just to the financial uh, aspects of our financial and audit, audit our financial and um, <laughs> audit committee, um, let me just give you a few updates. Uh, there weren't a lot of major updates at all this month uh, with regards to our accounts payable invoiced, uh, and these are for the months. These are for the month of September. Um, we invoiced it. The we the invoices paid were fifty five million dollars in addition to um, for, uh, what was paid were paid the month before, totaling one hundred thirty nine million accounts payable in process were uh, down by 48 million to 82 million and that's down from the previous month which would have been August in our cash management and that's cash that we've got available cash management uh, uh, dropped by 165.7 million in uh, uh, September down to 1.817 billion uh, that's also down about 313 million from a year before. That was uh, September of 20. The cap, cap and trade, uh, the August auction estimate is about 252 uh, million. Uh, it'll be reflected in our cash management report when that number is final um, and the allocations are received. The November auction, as you may know, occurred yesterday. There are no results that we are aware of. Uh, there might be some preliminary information that uh, comes out uh, sometime around the 24th. Um, with regards to the administration's budget uh, in September, uh, as a result of SB 170, we uh, received an additional uh, $16.7 million allocation for administration, uh, which increased us to 91 million for the fiscal year. Uh, we also uh, were authorized an additional 73 uh, state positions. Uh, increasing the authorized positions to 429, uh, of which uh, 283 are currently filled, which gives us a vacancy of about 34%. And uh, we anticipate that number uh, by the end of October uh, to have dropped to 33.3% with the addition of uh, three uh, uh, vacancies having been filled. Our capital budget, as you know, for uh, the Fiscal year 21-22 is 2.3 uh, billion. Um, 
we are now about 20, at least through September, we were 25% into the fiscal year. Uh, fiscal year, we had spent 11.1% uh, of the, um, ex of the uh, annual, annual budget uh, with 25% of the year having passed. Uh, on the state uh, match to ARA, um, we have uh, $40.9 million uh, uh, that we expect that we expect uh, by probably October the 31st uh, will be remaining on uh, the match. Um, the, the match, as you might recall, is $2.5 billion. So we're about there and would expect to probably by the end of October or hopefully by the end of October to have reached a full match on the R funding. Um, on the expenditure report, um, we in the expenditure report it defines what we currently have under contract, which is eight and a half, roughly eight and a half billion dollars. That increased by 15.1 million in the month of September. Our um, small business utilization rate. Um, uh, increased by one tenth of a percent, uh, up to 23.2 percent, and that represents about a 43.2 percent increase since the inception of our following uh, that uh, the small business uh, utilization reporting, uh, which was began in uh, February of 2015. At that time, we were at 16.2 percent, and um, with regards to contingency. Uh, the Rev One contingent, contingency, there's 1.405 billion remaining. Uh, no change orders in the month of September exceeded uh, 25 million. The total change orders were 16. Um, with regards to the Central Valley status report, uh, I would only mention uh, the design build expenditures in the month of September were 32.8 million. Cumulative, cum cumulatively, the expenditures uh, for CPs one, two, three, and four for the um, design build contractors uh, is, have our total 3.517 billion. The total contracted value is 5.225 billion, or in other words, about 67.3% having been expended. Uh, and the risk contingency for construction uh, remaining uh, is 554 million. Uh, or about 20.8% of that which was originally, alloc uh, originally allocated. Um, and labor uh, for the month of September, uh, the, the average daily labor out on our jobs dropped by about 115 uh, average per day uh, down to 936. And that was for the month of September. And with that, I, didn't, uh, I don't have any more that I uh, intended to present to you, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, seeing none. Um, that brings us to the end of our agenda. And as you heard earlier, uh, uh, in December, we are what, are we the 19th and 20th in, in, uh, in our board meetings in December? I think it's December 16th. Yeah, I'm sorry, 16th and then 19th and 20th in, in January. January. Yeah. Right. Okay, and with that then, do any of the members have any uh, any questions or comments or anything that you'd like to raise before we adjourn? Okay, seeing none, then uh, thank you all very much. And for you and the public, thank you for stay, being with us today. And uh, we uh, look forward to your joining us again next month. Um, thank you all very much. And the meeting is now adjourned.